Broadcasting from the spooky south coast and around the world on Midnight.fm, this is Midnight Society. I'm your host, Tim Weisberg. Whether it is the brightest of day or the darkest of night, wherever you may be, it's time to hunker down for the next three hours as we enter into a world of wonder and weird that you won't hear anywhere else. And tonight, we're going to be talking about death and dying, but don't worry. It's not as bad as it sounds. That's what our guest tonight, Kelvin Chin, is going to tell us because he is the founder of the Turning Within Meditation and Overcoming the Fear of Death Foundations. He's going to talk with us not only about overcoming the fear of death, but also about some of his near-death experiences and also some of his reincarnation experiences. So we'll learn from Kelvin about how there's really nothing to worry about because... There is more than what we have here. There is more to this life, and he's going to tell us all about it. And during the program, if you would like to call in at any point, you can do so at 508-322-1985. I know that I had said that there was the chance that uh, I might be a little bit withheld by storms if uh, if the power went out or if the cable went out or any of that kind of stuff. Well, I'm proud, proud. I'm happy to report that uh, that is not the case because the storm, Tropical Storm Faye, shifted west, which means it's not going to hit directly over where I am, like originally believed. So that's helpful. We will still get some rain. We will still get some wind. We will still get some thunderstorms, and that could cause issues. Uh, but for right now, I just put the dog out before the show began and things still look okay out there. The winds are starting to pick up a little bit, but I'm just warning you if the power goes out, if the cable goes out, if suddenly the show goes out, that's what happened. And I promise you that, uh, I will try everything that I can to get back on, but if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. So we'll, we'll try and do everything the best that we can. Uh, but I think we'll be okay. I'm not really overly concerned about it, but that's what's fun about broadcasting from home is that you never know what could happen. You never know if there's going to be a storm. You never know if there's going to be, uh, you know, the cable goes out or they suddenly decide to update right in the middle of the program like they used to do on the, the previous show that I was on. There's lots of things that can happen and lots of things that can go wrong, but we will do all that we can to try and work our way around them. So let's get right into the discussion tonight. I'm not going to waste any more time because we have a lot to cover with our guest tonight. And I don't want to eat that time up worrying about a storm that may not happen. Kelvin Chin is the executive director and founder of the Turning Within Meditation and Overcoming the Fear of Death Foundations. He is an internationally recognized meditation teacher featured in Business Insider, Newsweek, Kaiser Health News, and has taught meditation at West Point and in the U.S. Army, including on the DMZ in Korea. Kelvin is also the author of the best-selling Overcoming the Fear of Death Through Each of the Four Main Belief Systems, a non-religious approach to the four belief systems that underlie all religious and cultural beliefs. He has had many experiences piercing the veil over the past 35 years, and his past life memories reach back 6,000 years. And you're going to hear all about that. Kelvin is a featured speaker at numerous conferences, and uh, you've probably heard him on my previous program as well, talking about some of those. Uh, he is also a graduate of Dartmouth, Yale, and Boston College Law. He has lived in seven countries and so far has worked with clients in 41 countries, and he joins us tonight on Midnight Society. Good evening, Kelvin. How are you? Hey, Tim. Great to be here. Great, Great to, to talk with here. you again. How, how are you holding up these days? It's good to say, you know, I'm holding up and my family's holding up, but I hope uh, other people are holding up who are listening. It's been tough. I, I have a lot of clients, as you know, and around the world, and some of them have had COVID-19 oh, and no. uh, been through uh, some tough times, quite frankly. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that this is a time when, you know, you, you don't, you don't want to see it happen, but I'm sure this is the time when people are reaching out to you and your foundations because they have an overwhelming fear of what's going on and, and where it could end up leading them. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, um, and for those people who may be doubters out there, it's real. This is not, not a joke. It's not a conspiracy. It really is a virus and people are really getting sick and some people are getting very, very sick. Uh, so it's, 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 it's real. Yeah, yeah. So I've been helping a lot of people. Uh, my meditation classes, as you mentioned, have been full since the beginning of March. I've been 
I'm like booked up through July 24th or something. Like every week, uh, my classes are in full, 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 full. So yeah. But now the, the other side of that though is that you're able to help people overcome those fears and you're able to help people realize that there is nothing to fear about death. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's a big part of my nonprofit work as well, as you say, is helping people reduce their fears and, uh, you know, ideally eliminate their fears about death and dying so that they can live their life more here in the present, here right now with their loved ones and doing whatever they're doing, you know, enjoying life as much as possible, right? And, and so that's something that, uh, you know, when we talked before, I was part mm -hmm. of, on my previous program, I was part of a special right. night all about death and dying, and we we tried to look at it at different approaches, but people do have to kind of go through the stages of grief, and, and they have to go through uh, the acceptance and understanding of death in their own way, but for so many people, there's just, there is no guiding hand for that. There is no playbook for it. It's just, you know, you have to process it however you process it, but it seems like you found a way to help people um, get through that in a way that's that's far more healthier than trying to do it alone. Yeah, I take a different approach on on both the grief and the grieving issue as well as the uh, helping people reduce and eliminate their fears about death and dying. You know, typically the approaches that are generally available out there for most people are either religious approach, as you know, or what I call a therapy, a therapeutic a therapy approach, you know, maybe a psychotherapist or a you know psychiatrist or a minister priest uh spiritual um you know person and so forth which is which is all good and helpful but i was thinking you know how can i help people that's in a different way so how what how can i kind of meet the need in a way that's not being met so um that's when i came up as as you mentioned in my book and so forth the four belief systems that underlie and support all the religious and cultural beliefs out there. So um, to talk about it in a way that's rational, that's that's logical, talk about death and dying in a logical way, not a mystical way. So a big part of what I do is to try to demystify the mystical in a nutshell, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's and that's, that's probably something that um, I would say – what, how I'm trying to think in my head and do the math, how long mankind has been around for. But that's something that it's taken us this long to be able to get to because for as long as we've known that people die, we've been afraid of death. Yeah, there's just been a lot of superstition around it, a lot of, well, misunderstanding and so forth because obviously it's, it, it, it's you know, I mean, look at, uh, you know, kind of the uh, the essence of your work and through your shows and so forth. It's not a normal everyday experience that people experience what you, you may refer to as the paranormal. That's why it's called the paranormal because it's not normal, right? Um, so uh, the experience of the afterlife or being on the other side or near-death experiences or however you want to uh, label these types of experiences tend to be not normal. It's not everyday experience for most people. So then people start trying to fill in the gap. Okay, well. What is it? I, I've never experienced it, but I heard somebody said something, and they heard somebody say something about something, <laughs> you know, and there's multiple levels of hearsay, and we know how that story goes in kindergarten when you're sitting there and you tell the story around the circle, and you how it, how, you know, after 25 kids, you know, it gets, with 30 kids, it gets back to you, and you hear the, the version of the story that you started. Uh, it, it gets pretty, it, it gets pretty, uh, pretty changed, we'll say, you know? So yeah. uh, I think that's a big part of it. You know, it's just not an everyday experience for people uh, like, you know, like, like I've had for the last 40 years. It's not normal, you know? And, and, and the funny thing is, is it's not like anybody has, well, I mean, we will talk about how people have done this, but you know, there's just no generally accepted or generally understanding widespread knowledge of people that have come back from that and been able to explain exactly what's going on. We've had, it seems like we've had an increase in near death experiences in, in maybe the last 30 or 40 years, or at least people being vocal about them, but it's still right. a very hard thing for the general public to listen to and to accept. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think it's the, the vocal. Well, well plus, first of all, you get the raw number of the human population that's increased 7.6 billion people, right? I think a lot of people, I, I did the math and I look back at history. Uh, cause I, cause I, cause I like to look at facts, you know, rather than, um, any, you know, to, 
the extent that I can reduce the anecdotal evidence. And the factual evidence is that, you know, it's now 7.6 billion people on planet Earth. You know what the population was in 1900, only 120 years ago? No. Yes. What do you think? I would say a billion. Yeah, it was 1.6 billion. Oh, that was a good So guess. in 120 years, 6 billion new souls have incarnated as humans on planet Earth. That's like crazy number, right? That's like quadrupled in 120 years. Out of the, you know, we don't know how many hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years, you know, the humans have been on Earth, depending on how you define human, the human species and so forth. Um, we've been around a long, 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 long time. But the population is just, if you do a graph, it's just gone skyrocketed in the last hundred years. So um, the point, you know, so you look at the raw number in terms of your numbers of people who have had NDEs and then a percentage of that, and the percentage of that's probably pretty much, you know, around the same. I mean, the, the research that Gallup did in 1992, I think it was, uh, 1991, 92, somewhere around there, I... Um, I researched it and I put it in my book. Let me see if I can find it real quickly here. But it was somewhere around, um, you know, I want to say 17, 18 percent or something like that of the of the U.S. population. And pretty much that was it, um, you know, for the um, yeah. here it is. What was it? Five percent, five percent of the U.S. population. So I'm remembering the raw number in 1992. Gallup poll conducted in 1992, 13 million Americans reported having had an, a near-death experience, which was about 5% of the U.S. population at the time. And similar statistical studies have been shown in other countries. But, um, yeah, so the number is pretty significant. You know, it's a pretty big raw number. And, you know, the population, thats that was, what, 30 years ago. So the population is significantly bigger now. But um, still, you know, it's still a minority. So, you know. Right, but it's Work still gets around slowly. It's still enough people to make you think that there's something going on. You know, if sure. if if five percent of anybody does anything, you know, it's at least worth paying attention to. Exactly. Yeah, five percent. It's a it's a it's a decent percentage, and um, and then you have the the factor of people having different experiences, which I think a lot of people don't take that into consideration. The fact that let's just use that number: thirteen million people, the nineteen ninety two number, um, and. Uh, so what's the population now? Let's see, 5% of 330 million now, which would be, what, 15 million. So that's actually the first number that I came up with, interesting. So about 15, 16 million, let's just say that's the number today in today's population of the United States. 15 to 16 million people having a near-death experience. However, they're having different near-death experience. In other words, there are different variations of the near-death experience. And so people will come back and they'll have a variation this and a variation that and so forth. And we can get into that. But it's it's it, it's it, there is a wide range of that as well. And my near death, near death experience was different still from what a lot of people um, have had. So there's a range there even within the NDE population. So to your original point, you know, how do we get a handle and put a finger on these these, these types of experiences on the other side and so forth when? There's so many different um, subjective experiences. Yeah, we're definitely happen. we're definitely going to break down some of the differences of people's experiences because, to me, that's part of the 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 more interesting aspect of this is that it 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 does kind of hit different for everybody, and we'll we'll get into all that a little bit later on, I think. But sure. Uh, but before we get into that deeper stuff, let's get into some more of the the just the nuts and bolts of your work and and what you do. Mm. How mm. was it that you ended up? starting the the foundations and, and, and helping people overcoming the fear of death. Yeah, the first thing that happened uh, for me with the, the kind of sort of got me started focusing on this work. And again, focus I, was a very uh, gradual process over a period of decades, me focusing on this work. I've been doing this full time now uh, for about the last seven, eight years, but I've been doing this work for the last 35 years. 45 years, depending on which aspect. So if we're looking at the death and the dying work uh, in, the, in the grief uh, and grieving work, that kick-started in, in 1982 at the death of my mom. So my mom died in 1982 when she was pretty young. She was in her 50s, and um, 
she was really the paragon of health and strength and I mean powerful woman at five foot zero inches tall. <laughs> she was very she packed a punch in a small package, let's just say. Uh, a Renaissance woman, really amazing woman, chemistry major at Boston University, came over from China when she was three years old with her mom and so forth, um, did a lot of things in her life. And I was very close to her and she died and it really rocked, rocked me psychoemotionally. You know, it was, it was the first person I'd been very, very close with who died. You know, my grandfather had died earlier, you know, it, 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 he was 90 or something, you know, it's different. And I wasn't as close to him as I was my mom and a couple of uncle, distant uncles and that kind of thing. But this was the one that really struck home for me. And I was really, you know, I'd already been meditating, fortunately, for about 12 years at the time. I'd already been teaching meditation for eight or nine years when my mom died in, in 1982. So I'd already taught a thousand people to meditate. So I was an experienced meditator, an experienced meditation teacher, but I was close with my mom. So, you know, it's human being and I have emotions and feelings and all of that. And, and, um, that's what really kickstarted the whole thing for me. And then I started talking to people at school and so forth. And then they started telling me stuff about their dead loved ones and so forth and what they were going through. And it was just a, really a trial and error process. I was not, I was not studying therapy or psychotherapy or anything like that. I was in law school at the time. And so, but, but, but I just, uh, bumbled my way through the trial and error process, quite frankly, of seeing what worked and what made me feel better and what made them feel better when I was talking to other people and so forth. And it just kind of mushroomed over the decades, even while I had my day job. And and was it a matter of, of seeing all these different approaches and just cherry picking from here and there? Or did or does one does one technique or one thing kind of just lead in and blend into another? Yeah, it's interesting. So I became certified as a grief recovery specialist, uh, grief recovery expert, uh, whatever they call it, um, uh, was about five or six years ago. But interestingly enough, uh, the folks who wrote the book, Russell Friedman and John James, who wrote this book on grief recovery, it's available on Amazon, whatever. It may be helpful to some listeners if they uh, want to Google it. It's a very inexpensive book, but it's very good. And they wrote basically my approach that I'd been using since the mid 1980s with people. Um, like I said, I was just doing this nights and weekends for decades for free, you know, just with people. Um, and, and, my, and the approach was essentially no, non judgment about grief. Don't judge your grief. Nobody's, you, you know, you, you don't judge your own grief and don't compare your grief to other people's grief. And there is all these myths about grief. And I, and I just kind of intuitively knew that or found that out just from talking to people. Like you'll hear people will say, just give it time. Don't worry to give it time. Well, if you tell that to somebody who's just lost a loved one or something really significant, like a loved one, because there are many, many other kinds of losses to divorce, financial loss and so forth. But let's just talk about the loss of a loved one. It pisses them off. You know, it, it, it really angers people when you sell, when they're grieving and you say, oh, don't worry, just give it time. You'll, you'll, you'll get over it. You'll feel better. It's all, it's, 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 it's almost disrespectful. Now, I understand why, because as I, I said to you, I, I went through this trial and error thing with other people and you kind of, no, oh, that didn't work. Uh, and, and, and you can see why somebody would say it because you're trying to make the person feel better. So, but you're grappling with what can I say in this horrific situation where their uh, brother got killed in a motorcycle accident? Just you, you, you see him in the morning, you don't see him in the afternoon. What do you say? And so, we as a culture are terrible at this, at expressing our feelings first of all, and in expressing our feelings about people's loss. Um, so, instead, it would be more helpful, for example, to say. I'm so sorry to hear that about your brother, and you know I, can, I, I, I can't imagine what you're going through right now, but just know that I'm here to, to, to listen to you and to hear whatever you have to say and express however you want to express it to me, um, you know, just to be there for them. That's really what people need the most is not being judged, not being put off, not being shut up. I mean, a lot of times you'll see families, they'll just say, oh, the kids, uh, you know, or you're, you're, you're upset or, you know, the husband or the wife or vice versa will send the other one upstairs. You want to, you want to, you want to cry? Go upstairs. I'm watching TV. 
Well, that's like, no, that people need to be with each other when we're going through these terrible emotional grieving moments and, 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 and help each other, help support each other. And then there's a whole, uh, program that, that I've been doing for decades and that I kind of got certified in as a, a reference, which helps the person recover from those missed hopes, dreams, and expectations that, and, and the co- conflicting feelings that, that often will come up, which is how I define grief and grieving. A, mi- a mix of conflicting feelings and the overwhelming sadness. I think a big mistake and, 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 and misunderstanding is that grief and sadness are the same thing. They're not the same thing. Oh, what's, the, what's the differences then? The difference is that grief, I call grief the overwhelming sadness that we go, the paralytic sadness. In other words, I'll give you an example. So I'm over, I'm, I have gotten over the overwhelming sadness from my mom's death. I am still sad about my mom having died in 1982. She never met my children and so forth, et cetera. And, you know, I never got to spend all this time with her. She never saw me really grow up from, you know, age 29 on. And so, uh, you, you know, that, that loss, that overwhelming part of that sadness, that's what, that, that's what I help people get rid of is the overwhelming part, the paralytic part, not their sadness. We never ever forget the, the loss of the loved one and the sadness and the feelings that go along with that. The, I think that's directly proportional. I think it, the, the, the depth of our sadness, in fact, is directly proportional to the depth of the relationship and the love we had for the person who we've lost. So I think that's a big mistake. You'll hear people say that. They'll equate sadness and grief. Big mistake. And the other thing is the conflicting feelings, as I mentioned. So my mom would say to me, don't come visit me in the hospital uh, you should be studying. You know, I'm dying. You just don't waste your time coming. It was only a 45 minute drive from where I was at Boston College, you know, over to the hospital she was at in Walpole, Massachusetts. And so do I go? Do I not go? I have all these conflicting feelings. And then I would go and bring my books in. And she would say, don't. What did you come for? She said, go down to the chapel and study. I go down to the chapel and cry. Right. You know, I couldn't study. And then she dies. And I have all these conf- should I conflicting feelings. Should I have listened to her? Should I have not listened to her? Should I have gone more often? Et cetera. So many people have had various types. That's just my experience. But people who've been through grieving processes, having lost someone like that, they know what I'm talking about. There's these conflicting feelings. There's no relationship that's absolutely perfect. There's a shoulda, woulda, coulda. I shoulda said this. And, oh, I could have said that in that situation five years ago before, you know, dad died or whatever. My sister or my son died, whatever, you know. Well, we're going to take our first break here coming up in just a moment. When we come back on the other side, we'll we'll dive deep into what the four main belief systems and we'll talk about those and and we'll continue on with kind of just setting up the idea of what death and dying are all about. And then when we go forward with our discussion, we'll get into Kelvin's experiences. We'll find out not only about things like after death communication, near death experiences and all of that. We'll also discuss uh, a lot of his reincarnation experiences as I said in the introduction. Having reincarnation experiences, past life memories that go back 6,000 years, that's going to give us a lot to talk about tonight. (laughs) And so we will do that. And we'll also take your calls as well at 508-322-1985. That's 508-322-1985. You can call in at any point with a question. You can also email me, tim at midnight.fm, or post your question in the Midnight Society Facebook group. Or if you're a member at midnight.fm, at the insider or elite level membership, you will have access to the discord server and you can jump in there and post your questions as well. We try to make it very interactive. That's why it's the midnight society. We're all here together to kind of work through discussions like this and hopefully make people's lives a little bit better for it. We'll take our first break now and then we'll be back more with Kelvin chin coming up in just a bit as we are talking tonight about experiences on the other side. And we'll have more on the other side of this break coming your way. Right here on Midnight Society on Midnight.fm.
show. Dial 508-322-1985. That's 508-322-1985. Or Skype midnight.fm. Welcome back to Midnight Society here on Midnight.fm. Tonight we are talking with Kelvin Chin about experiences on the other side. We're going to learn more about overcoming the fear of death. We're going to learn more about what happens when we die. And, uh, of course, as as said there by the Amy system, you can call in 508-322-1985 if you have questions. Because I think a lot of people do, Kelvin. And, and you were talking before about people... Mm-hmm not being able to be there for others when they're going through the loss of someone. And it, it is that really mm-hmm. just as simple as it makes us talk about something that we're uncomfortable with, that, that we have to face something we're afraid of and that we'd rather not think about. I think it's a big part of it. Yeah. I think a big part of it is, uh, you know, and even healthcare workers who I train, you know, uh, on uh, both, how to overcome their own fear of death and to help them talk with others, um, patients and so forth who may have different belief systems about death and dying than, than they, the healthcare worker does. Um, you know, they need to get a handle on that too, because a lot of, a, a lot of the kind of distancing, emotional distancing that we all do and including healthcare workers do, uh, can lead to, oh, you know, just saying inappropriate things or, just or saying nothing and just uh, not connecting with the person who is in that grieving mode or in or in the death mode themselves as a patient even you know yeah i mean i know that i i don't do well with anybody experiencing any kind of emotion so when somebody <laughs> comes at me in any kind of emotional state i'm always like whoa chill out or you know uh, i'm not really the person to help you with that but i know i know that that's you know a personality deficiency on my own part i don't i don't think that that's you know any kind of inherent fear or anything it's just i'm a terrible person well but- some people are wired differently it's not that you're a terrible person tim some people are you know everybody's wired differently and some people are more comfortable with say uh, with their emotions and with other people expressing, expressing their emotions to them than other people. And that's okay. You know, we're, nobody's the same and there's no right one size fits all. But I think that, I think if I could say one thing, it would be just to listen, open to listening to that person who is coming to you with whatever they're saying in an emotional way and listen in as, in a, as non-judgmental a way, when I say non-judgmental, I mean not judging them as a person for who they are and how, you know, I say ju- we judge behavior. We, we cannot judge people's uh, spiritual evolution, let's say, how they are internally. That's between them and themselves. Nobody can judge that. Um, but, you know, as long as their behavior isn't such that they're coming at you emotionally, uh, with with a literal or or figurative knife, then uh, then I think that you know we can be in a, a more receptive listening mode, you know, to the person. I think that's the easiest first step, you know. Yeah, and I also think that you know part of what I've gained from doing this program and 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 mm. talking about a lot of things is I've gained kind of better insight into people. And the way that they, they process things themselves and, and that kind of helps me understand a little bit that there, there is a difference to it, that not everybody's going to look at things the same way that I do. Uh, exactly. I, I've always tried to be like, you know, the, the non-emotional person. And, yeah. you know, when somebody passes away, I try to be the, the person that's like, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to get that. We're going to do that. And, you know, to the point that when, you know, a friend of the, the family's father passed away, you know, before I even know it, I'm sitting there in a meeting at the at the um, funeral director's office, and I'm like, "How did I get here? I don't even I never even met this person." But it's just because for some reason I'm the one that they think can be brought into a situation and not become emotional uh, in yeah. that situation. So I think the issue is is what you're describing is being rational and logical and able to manage a situation that sometimes can get a little bit uh, unwieldy emotionally. There's nothing wrong with that. I consider that a strength, quite frankly, Tim. Um, I think what what we're talking about is something different. I think we're talking about, at least what I'm talking about anyway, is 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 when people squelch emotions and they shut them down 
where they shut other people down. Um, the ability to navigate emotional situations in a way that's rational, even, even, and even while you are own, maybe yourself experiencing emotions, I know you said you tend not to so much, but what I'm saying is hypothetically, someone who can experience the waves of their emotions and whatever they are and act in a clear minded, rational way, notwithstanding the waves of emotions, that's, I think that's what we, 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 we should aspire to, not being a robot. I don't want to, I don't, I, I don't want to encourage people to being a robot, and I don't want to encourage people to being irrationally, emotionally swept away by everything that comes across their life. So, so it, I think it's a combo platter of the two where you're not swept away, and yet you are, you can experience it. In, in that sense, I'm using the word rational, meaning, not being overwhelmed by the experience and still can think clearly throughout whatever it is as well. I think those are the anchors. And you may be that person, Tim, in those kind of, you know, intense situations that you're just, that, that's, I think that would, that, that may be the way the other people see you. <laughs> you don't, may not see yourself that way, but I think maybe other people may see you that way as kind of that anchor who can help guide us through. A very intense emotional situation. That's a that's a that's a strength. Well, and and what you're what you're saying with learning, you know, not to to run too hot or cold emotionally here. Then does that mean that the the techniques and the things that you teach toward uh, overcoming death and dying and, and and the fear of that can it be applied to other emotional states as well? Absolutely, yeah. So I so I I have my uh, work kind of. Uh, trifurcated, so it kind of split off into three different areas. I got my meditation work, I have my overcoming the fear of death and dying work, and I have my spiritual work, helping people with various spiritual um, um, concepts, including afterlife reincarnation, but also including how to spiritually uh, act in a, in a in a positive, holistic way in our waking state, everyday life here on planet Earth. So I kind of split up into three different categories. So yes, yeah, sometimes my work will overlap. The, you know, w- you know, the meditation will be appropriate in certain situations to help people reduce their fears about death and dying because they're f- very overwhelmed or whatever with that. And then how can we help re- balance out their cortisol? Um, and um, so, so the various tools and techniques that I apply will cross over those different areas in different ways. Absolutely, yes. And, and that's something that I think is even more beneficial because you, you know, you want to say, well, I hope that, uh, nobody around me dies and I have to utilize these things that Kelvin can teach us, but to know that it can work across the board for other things as well, you know, then it just goes to show that it's, uh, you know, it actually takes away some of the fear of even having to learn to overcome the fear. Exactly. Because ultimately, really, if you distill down any fear about death and dying, it doesn't matter how the person articulates it, um, it really distills down to one fear. And the, it's the fear of uncertainty, the fear of the unknown. That's typically what it is. Now, it may be the fear of the unknown of X, Y, or Z, fill in the blank, but it's the fear of uncertainty, the fear of the unknown. And so what I do with people is help them reduce their fears and get rid of their fears. I tell them right up front, that, look, I can't get rid of uncertainty. We live in an a free will universe. It's an uncertain free will universe. It's, it's all these minds have free will, make personal choices. We don't have control over other people's choices, but I can help you reduce your fear about the, uh, all of that unknown. And so what will that do? That will increase your ability to control what you can control, which is your own life and so forth. And it will decrease your, your, your ne- internal need to feel like you can even try to control other people's lives, which is an illusion. You can't do that anyway. And that reduces people's fears and anxieties, whether it's about death and dying or whether it's about anything. You know, so I, I help a lot of people uh, through the meditation technique I teach and then the various classes that I teach deal with other anxieties that are not related to death and dying as well. And, and, and it helps them so they can live life more fully in the present, because that's always my objective. Doesn't matter which of the, um, you know, arms of the uh, of, of the nonprofit work that I do. 
Well, but let's let's get into the four main belief systems uh, that you teach. But before sure. we do that, I think we should kind of, you know, just revisit the idea of the the Kubler Ross model of the five stages, so that people understand. You know, if they're not familiar with with that, what what is yeah. what is that so, so, trying to so tell the us? The Kubler Ross, the Kubler Ross five stages of grief thing. You know, it, you know, anger and so forth, and all that that, that kind of comes up, et cetera, et cetera. I I, I don't want to go through and go through those because. Right. I don't want to emphasize those, quite frankly, because those are a mistaken. They're still being taught in an incorrect way uh, by psychotherapy schools. I, ha- I get a lot of uh, refer- referrals from psychotherapists, psychiatrists, cardiologists, different doctors, but with just in the death and dying arena from psychotherapists and psychiatrists. Um, and I, I'll ask them and some of them are my friends and I'll say, you know, one of my friends at the NYU and. So far, the very good program. It's over. And I said, what, what did they talk to you about grief and grieving? And over? Said, well, you didn't cover it too much, a little bit, you know, a class here and there, whatever, not that much. Um, and, and, and one of the myths or misunderstandings out there is about the Kubler-Ross five stages of grief. Kubler-Ross herself um, said in, I think it was her third book, she said one of her, the biggest regrets that she has is that people took those five uh stages of grief to be pillars in stone that everybody has to go through. And she said it was never her intent. In fact, the facts are that the, uh, this is a little quick anecdotal facts on this, not even anecdotal, but it's, this is the facts that happened. She, she went and, and interviewed uh, groups of terminally ill people at the hospital and asked them what they were going through. So it was not a scientific study. It was anecdotal evidence. It was just stories from those, those, those patients who were all terminally ill. People have then taken that and they, because it's so easy to talk about, well, you got five and you have to go through this one and then that one, that one. People who've been grieving all know that you don't always go through all those five Kubler Ross stages. Sometimes you might go through two of them, the three of them, and you don't feel angry, you don't feel this and blah, 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 whatever. She meant them as a guidepost, but for, first of all, it was for terminally ill people. It wasn't for, for example, a parent who'd lost a child or a, a, a husband who had lost a wife or whatever, any other kind of losses. It was terminally ill people talking about themselves. It wasn't the grieving person talking about having lost somebody. OK, that's you. If you go on the Kubler-Ross website, it actually talks about this uh, and so forth, um, how they, they, they're not meant to be pillars in stone like the way they're taught in psychotherapy school. So I I don't get into those because that's a misunderstanding. Instead, I talk about grief in the way that I talked about with you, and I help people reduce, 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 and get recovery from those the grieving experience through that through through this 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 program that probably it's that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> well, and, and that's, I totally agree with you because I, you know, when I've lost people, I've never gone through the five stages that they, that they, exactly. you know, the people look at. I mean, I've never bargained in any way for it, exactly. you know, and, and I feel like I, I kind of feel all of the different things that I'm going to feel all at once. You know, it's not a process yeah. of from one to the next. It's not, it's not a linear process. It's not a step by step process. But again, the Kubler Ross stages are easy to teach in school. All right. And so, and it's easy to test somebody on those, but it's not accurate human experience. Well, and it's also easy to try to force people into each one, you know, yeah. to say, well, you should yeah. be, you should be going through denial right now. Okay. Oh, oh, really? I'm not experiencing that. Oh, maybe I'm doing something wrong. That's what's wrong in my book about a lot of the grief work that's out there. Oh, I'm not experiencing that. Oh, I'm experiencing grieving incorrectly. No, your experience of grief is what it is. Let's talk about that. All right. So, 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 so that should be the general approach. Um, but yeah, if you look, if you go back now that I've said this and people in your audience go back and they look at the five Kubler Ross stages of grief and they think about it through the lens of somebody who's terminally ill, they make a lot more sense then. Really? Right. You're yeah. bargaining for more time in your own life. You're angry because you're not going to be able to be with your loved ones or whatever. You know, you go through those five stages and put yourself in the place of the actual people that she spoke with in the hospital that come up with those five stages. They were all terminally ill people. It makes a lot more sense then. 
Yeah, I can see that. It certainly does fit into that more and more so. And, and certainly, uh, you can see how you, it does become a linear process in that regard. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Even then it's never linear, but yeah, it could be more linear. But yeah, grieving is, is, is a, is a unique process to each individual. It needs to be honored in the way that particular person is, is, is grieving. And quite frankly, not everybody is ready, uh, ready, willing, and able at the, at any given, at, at a certain period of time, at a certain time to, 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 to let go of their, of their grieving. For some people, it's almost like a, 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 an anchor in a way, even though it's debilitating and even though it's not healthy for them, they kind of use it in that way. So, you know, a good uh, grief recovery person will recognize all those things and work with the person and help them through the process at the pace that that person is, is comfortable with without forcing, you know. And uh, it's important to note, too, that as we're talking about this, as we go through this tonight, it's not. It's not a religious experience, what it is that we're talking about, but it doesn't mean that religion can't help you through the process, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, people can be very religious or very not religious, you know, a religious, not religious at all. It really doesn't matter. But religion can sometimes help people through, through, through that process if they believe in an afterlife, for example. All right. But even if they don't, I've worked with people who don't believe in an afterlife and that's okay too. And we talk about that. And I help them understand through these four belief systems that I came up with that we talk about in my book, you know, how to think about the death and dying process so that it is not so fearful to that person. Okay. That, that, that's the critical thing. Reducing the fear so that we're expanding the person's ability to live life. So let's get into then, uh, the, the way that you teach it, the approach that you have with the four main belief systems. Yeah. So the four belief systems are simply, and keep in mind, they're not religious and they're not cultural, and they underlie and support, as I said earlier, all of the religious and cultural beliefs that exist in the world. So, and it came about because I was, you know, at, back in the 1980s when my mom died, I was be talking to people and I'd find that people would get into arguments, you know, if there was more than two of us. If it's usually just two of us talking, then we're usually pretty respectful of each other. But if you get three or four or five people in a group conversation talking about death and dying, there's always going to be somebody who's starting to push their own agenda and their belief systems on the group because they want to be validated, you know? Sure. And so I thought, you know, how can we get away from pushing religious or cultural beliefs on other people and still talk about this elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about, the death experience or the dying experience and so that's when i was brainstorming with a buddy of mine george and we were talking and we came up with these four beliefs so the first one is the science belief it's the no afterlife it was my dad's belief system no afterlife this is it one life you you, you live you die you, and my dad would say put me in a box throw me the dirt throw the dirt on me i'm done that was his famous phrase and then that's the first belief system we call the science belief, right? The brain and the mind are connected. The brain dies, mind shuts off. Okay, that's belief system number one, I call it. Belief system number two, I call the fear of continued existence. That's where you do believe in an afterlife, but there's some fear associated with it, and people may have different, you know, sources of the fear and so forth. Third belief system uh, is belief in an afterlife, but no fear. So maybe you're even looking forward to an afterlife and so forth. But you believe that there's an afterlife and you go to heaven or Valhalla or Nirvana, whatever you want to call it. Different cultures, religions may call it something different. And you go there and you hang out okay, in the afterlife. Fourth belief system, reincarnation, past lives. So the idea that you can come back, you can choose to hang out on the other side uh, in heaven or in the afterlife, whatever you want to call it. Or you can choose to get in a new body, a new vehicle, a new physical, biological vehicle. And come in and have another lifetime. So those are the four belief systems that exist in the world. And everybody falls somewhere in that spectrum. Now, some people may be hybrids. They may be fence sitters. They may be a little bit of this one and that one. I'd say the most, the most common fence sitters that I get who contact me from around the world, 42 countries so far, um, is, uh, the first and the second. They're the, like, they, they'll say, uh, I, I believe in the first belief system. I think this is it. One life. I don't believe in an afterlife. But then they'll, and I say, well, okay, well, what's the fear then? Because fear is 
I said, let's just define fear. Fear is the emotion caused by the anticipation of unhappiness. So if you really do believe, like my dad did, the first belief system, you should have no fear because you're gonna, your, your belief is that your brain shuts off and your mind shuts off and there's no experience. So why would there be any anticipation of unhappiness? There should be none. No anticipation of unhappiness. No fear. And they say, well, but I just fear oblivion or fear uh, being in outer space, you know, whatever, or whatever. They, they'll like articulate in, 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 typically in one of those ways or some similar way. And I say, okay, understand first. You have not just the first belief system, because if you did, you'd be like my dad, which is he just lived his life. That was it. You know, didn't have any fears. You have, you're a hybrid. You got a little bit of the second one there too. So let's talk about how, how we can, how we can reduce that fear. Yeah. I mean, but also fear is healthy to have to some degree though, right? I don't, not the way I define it. Fear is the anticipation of unhappiness. So it okay. depends how you're using fear. I've had people say, well, fear is a good thing because when I go to the Grand Canyon, uh, you know, uh, the fear of going over the edge and dying prevents me from going close to the edge. I say, really? Uh, no, that's called common sense. You, you, go, you go to the edge of the, you know, the Grand Canyon, you fall over, the, you, you're going to die. You just, that, that, that's not a fear. To me, that's, that's, that's rational thinking. I don't call that fear, right? You know? So, so how do you mean it? Um, I mean, I think that, you know, fear, it does kind of help us stay alive to some degree, you know, fear, fear protects us from, from thinking that we're invincible. Fear, the way I'm defining is uh, the emotion caused by the anticipation of unhappiness. So the way I'm defining it, I look, I'm looking at fear as a contracting thing, not an expanding thing. Okay. So. In other words, it contracts us, it uses up our energy that we could be better used in a way that you're, tr you're trying to describe. I'm saying that why not divert, why not, why not reduce our siphoning off of our energy that's, that's, that's used up our, our nervous energy in fear and instead channel that energy in a more positive way that helps us do productive things, kind of like what you're alluding to. Yeah, right. No, absolutely. And so then, if we if we do master that, then that will kind of, I would assume, keep us in that that expanding state. That then the fears go away, and the fears go away. You see, so it's a semantic thing that we're we're doing here together, right? So what so what happens is as we expand our mind and we experience how strong our mind is essentially what we're doing right now tim is we're kind of going through an analysis of how i help people who have fear of continued existence you know belief system number two is i i point out to them that if we can turn within and strengthen ourselves from within then that expands our conscious capacity for experience it strengthens us from the inside out our self-confidence goes up and our fear of uncertainty goes away because when you feel so powerful within and the fears then just dissipate, the, the, the wasted energy fear that I'm defining here is wasted energy, that goes away. It dissipates. It disappears. It reduces and reduces and reduces. Eventually, it's just so de minimis. It's just not there anymore. And the strength of your mind becomes the dominant feature of who you are. That is a fear-free personality. OK, but that comes from what the Greek sense of virtue. So what's the Greek sense of virtue? The Greek sense of virtue. So today is, is, is the way we think about virtue is very different today in 20, 21st century Earth. People think virtue. Oh, you should be a virtuous person by doing this and not doing that. And when you do that, you're not a virtuous person. So it's like a list of do's and don'ts. That's not what the ancient Greeks meant by virtue. So I use it in the ancient Greek sense. In, in terms of turning within, knowing thyself. So you've heard that term, know thyself, mm -hmm. know who you are, strengthen yourself from the inside out. That was the ancient Greek approach towards virtue. So I use that as an, as a, an example of how to strengthen ourselves and get rid of our fears. And that's what I teach people to do. 
All right. Well, we're going to take our next break here coming up. When we come back on the other side, we'll get into the idea of people having uh, going through this process and coming out of it on the other side, literally and figuratively. And we'll also talk about having past life experiences as well. And again, the phone lines will be open throughout the discussion. 508-322-1985. We'll be back with more Midnight Society in just a few moments right here on Midnight.fm. show dial 508-322-1985 that's 508-322-1985 or skype midnight.fm and welcome back into midnight society here on midnight.fm and Reminder for everybody, it's a big weekend for me personally, and I could use your help uh, this coming Saturday night, tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Eastern is the premiere of Hotel Paranormal on the Travel Channel. It is hosted, narrated by Dan Aykroyd, and you will see me uh, definitely on tomorrow night's episode and then on some other ones throughout the course of the season, offering some paranormal insight to experiences that people have when they experience the paranormal in hotels and motels and bed and breakfasts and I don't know, probably campgrounds, all different kinds of places. Uh, so if you could tune in tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Eastern for the premiere of Hotel Paranormal and help us get some big ratings, that'd be great. If for some reason you can't and you need to watch it on DVR, just watch it within the first three days, and then it will count toward the ratings. So they have two ratings that they use for television. They have live, and then they have what they call live plus three. So we want to make sure that uh, we have big numbers for both of those ratings. And then on Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern on the Weather Channel is Weird Earth. So that series has been ongoing now for a couple of weeks, and I appear on screen on that one as well. So if you could do the same for that, tune in either live or within the first three days if you DVR'd it, and help us keep going on with these great paranormal programs. I think that, you know, I like to say that I, I don't get involved with any uh, television production that I don't feel is going to handle things the right way, but it's a crapshoot. You know, they tell you one thing, and then when you get the actual, uh, you know, the actual uh, edit that shows on television, eh, it doesn't always kind of play out the way that they told you that it would. Well, I'm happy to say that with both of these productions, it looks like it's been exactly as promised and exactly they're delivering exactly what they said that they would. And so that makes me really want to stand behind them, and hopefully you will want to as well. So Hotel Paranormal tomorrow night, 10 p.m. Eastern on the Travel Channel, and then Weird Earth, 9 p.m. Eastern, Sunday night on the Weather Channel. All right, getting right back into our discussion tonight on experiences on the other side with our guest Kelvin Chin. And, and Kelvin, we were talking about the four main belief systems, but it's, it's not just a matter of explaining them to people and say, here you go, you have these now, you should be okay now. I mean, there's, there's a process of being able to, to learn those and, and to apply them. Oh, did I lose Kelvin? Let me see if I did. Hopefully, uh, he could just be on. Nope, looks like I lost him. Going to just reconnect with him real quick. Give me one second, and I'll do that. And this is the beauty of live radio. That's how you know that uh, I didn't pre-record this one before the storm was going to roll in, that uh, we actually are live and <laughs> having a technical difficulty, but we are going to try and reconnect now with Kelvin. And again, if you want to call in during the discussion, 508-322-1985 is the number. I think we have Kelvin back now. Are you with us? I with you. Yeah, yeah it, it, I'm not surprised. We're going to have some uh, some issues tonight. I wouldn't be surprised with with well, the weather the I have coming out in this neighborhood where I am. Oh, you you're going to lose power too? Well, I don't know. We we just our power went out everywhere. I could hear it. You know, people in the apartment complex, so forth and so on. So I still have. You know, I got a 
ninety-seven percent on my battery. So you're not in the you're not in the path of the storm, are you? Of the tropical storm? No, in Los Angeles. Oh so wow, yeah, other side figure. of the country. Yeah, go figure. Well, we'll try and uh, we'll we'll make sure we cover as much of it we can and the amount of battery that you have left. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so okay. what what I was saying is you can't just take these four main belief systems that you're you're talking about teaching and give them to people and say here you go you're all set now this should solve everything you have to teach them how to how to actually apply them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we started talking about that before the break in terms of the second one, and it's basically. The, the ancient Greek sense of virtue. So essentially in my language in 21st century today, we talk about turning within. So connecting within oneself, reducing our cortisol levels and balancing our lactic acid and the other 40 to 60 hormones and chemicals that get kicked out when we have our fight or flight response, which everybody is familiar about what that is. And, um, you know, we, uh, we, and, and we expand our mind outside what I call the supermarket aisle mind. The supermarket aisle is what? That's where we walk down the supermarket aisle and we make choices, and that's the focusing, decision-making part of our mind. So we need to expand our mind outside of that to the vastness of what our human mind is, and that combined with the biochemical changes that we can affect in our body, balancing the chemistry, brain chemistry, and so forth, that reduces our fear. Okay, so that's that's how we deal with that. Now, the third belief system is not a fear uh, because there's third one has is, is belief in afterlife with no fear. Right. Um, and uh, that may be looking forward to it. So I talk about that because it is one of the four belief systems. And then by talking about NDEs and spiritually transformative experiences and so forth uh, that can arise out of that third belief system. That can help other people who do have fears, give them data points to help them alleviate their fears. Because even though it's not their experience, it's not their NDE, uh, they may be um, positively influenced, let's just say, by hearing about somebody else's experience, like mine or somebody else's, for example. Okay. Mm-hmm. So- and in the reincarnation, of course, you know, there are people who have fears associated with reincarnation. You may think that, well... Believe in past lives, future lives, blah blah blah. How can you, why do you have a fear of death? Well, they may they may have related fears. They may have fear about, uh, you know, I literally know some Buddhists who have fears about what they're going to come back as. Are they going to be, you know, they have fears about being punished and coming back as a mosquito or something, you know? And it's an unfounded fear, and I'll talk to them about that. But the fear exists. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'd never thought about that. That you you may be afraid of what it is that you would come back as. I mean, I would, I'd look at it more as if you know that these, if you know that there is no real end of it, that it's that particular life may end, but that you yourself will go on. I would just look at that and be like, well, if I come back as an insect, I'll just have a really quick experience as an insect and then I'll be back (laughs) to be something else. Exactly. That's a very healthy way of looking at it. I think Tim, but again, you, we've already established about your personality, which is the more uh, rational, level-headed, we'll just say, kind of personality, right? And, and, and so you don't have those kinds of fears because you're, um, uh, you, 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 you think about things in a way that's fairly logical and, and, and clear, and it makes sense to you. And therefore, you dissipate those the fear of the unknown because you fill in the unknown with, well, I don't know that, but I know this. And what I do know about is this and this and this. And if that happens, I'll come back. I'll have a quick life as an insect and I'll come back as something else, which is very a, a very healthy way of looking at it, I think. I mean, I, <laughs> I honestly think it would be fun. It'd be fun to try different things and to see – you know what it's like to be, I mean, I, I don't think I'd want to spend, you know, 150 years as a tortoise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, I think seriously, I really mean this when I say to you and, and to your audience, I think that uh, based on my many memories that go back many, many thousands of years, as you know, uh, based on those experiences and my logic tells me that uh, that we're around for eternity, 
that's a really long time, as Woody Allen said. Eternity is a really long time, especially near the end. You know, it's, you know but it's like eternity is forever. There is no end, right? And so um, in that eternity, why not have the attitude that you just said? That's what I, I totally agree with you. And that's what that that's one of my teaching points is to have fun. Experiment. Have fun. You know, I, I've been an, I, I remember being an eagle in another lifetime. So not always human. So and not always on planet Earth either. Well, we can certainly get into a lot of that. But if if that's the case, and one thing that I've always wondered when it comes to the idea of reincarnation uh-huh. is, is there a finite number of souls or are new souls created? Yeah, I think that there is a, we'll just say, I think that there's a fairly finite number of souls. Uh, this is my theory, okay? Now, when I say fairly <laughs> finite, I'm talking about, I don't know, it's a big number. <laughs> Plus or minus uh, a billion. Quintillion? Yeah. quintillion? I don't know. I don't know what the number is. I think that here on planet Earth, we know we have 7.6 billion humans right now on planet Earth. How many of our dead relatives and who knows what other humans are on the other side, right? And then how many angels are there on the other side who've never been incarnated on planet Earth? I've had communications with them, too. How many, you know, other beings who are not angels who are on the other side have never been incarnated on planet Earth? There's, so add all these up. And then you add up the dogs and the cats because they have minds, kill horses, whatever. And it depends on how, how, how granular you want to go. Uh, I define mind by the way, when I say mind, I mean soul, spirit, consciousness, awareness, it, individual consciousness, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just use the word mind because, as I said, I work across so many different cultures. I, I use words that are fairly easy to understand for people, neutrally, uh, 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 ne- neutrally loaded as well as much as possible, not loaded emotionally or religiously and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, there's, 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 there's trillions, you know. Uh, of of minds on this planet, if you include not just the humans, I would think there's a lot. Yeah, but and- I think that to answer your question, I think it's more like I think it's kind of you know like those snow uh, those snow domes. I don't even know what they call them exactly, but you know, Christmas time oh, you yeah. have this little what, what do they call those? Snow, you know, the uh, snow globes. Yeah, snow globes. Yeah. It's like a snow globe with a scene in it and so forth. And there's this finite amount of snow in it. So let's just make believe that's like kind of like the souls in the universe or universes or who knows what. And then, but there's a finite number, but they can get mixed around. Like you shake the globe, you know, and it can kind of have different configurations and so forth and then different, oh, now you're over here and now you're over there, blah, 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 you know, kind of a thing. I think that's, I think it, that's, that's kind of the analogy for me. I mean, um, I think we can, our energies can take on different forms, but I think there is a finite number of, but it's a huge number. Well, and you also mentioned that some souls are on the other side at any given time. Is that, oh, yeah. is that a, 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 is that a choice or is there a transition period? What, why would there be souls that aren't, that haven't been reincarnated? Oh, because we can hang out on the other side and it's an R and R side. My, so I have experiences on the other side, as you know, just from um, from various spiritual experiences that I've had that 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 uh, in other words, I can go experience the other side while I'm physically in Kelvin Chin's body here on planet Earth. So I have that ability to experience the other side. So my experience is much like other people who've had NDEs and so forth um, uh, where they've go to, gone to the other side is that the other side is a place of R&R. It's like rest and relaxation. It's vacation time. It's the time to chill out on the other side. If you want to come back in a physical form and be reincarnated, you can. You don't have to. There's nobody saying, thou shalt go back, or you can only spend a certain amount of time over here in heaven or uh, in the afterlife or whatever you want to call it. You know, you can hang out there for a long time. I've hung out there two, three, four hundred years sometimes in between lifetimes, in my last lifetime, when I died in World War II, I was only on the other side for about eight Earth years. And keep in, we can get into this later, but the experience of time and space on the other side is very different from here. But um, no, you can, you can go on the other side for any number of uh, years that you want to hang out on the other side just to chill out. So there's lots of souls on the other side who are chilling out for a while. 
uh, before they you know, they come back here. And and you various- you said you can basically be you can biolocate yourself. You can be in both places at the same time. No, not not both. That's not my experience. Some people okay. talk about that. And that's never been my experience. Uh, now, the ex- people talk about time and space being the same or folded in this way and that way. These are all theories. My experience does not match with any of those uh, theories, but I understand where some of those theories can come from and be and, and lead to conflations and confusions. Uh, I'll give you an example. Like, um, if we die, and my experience is that we do die, but let's, you know, for those listeners who have not had the experience, let's just use it as a hypothetical. If you, if we do die physically, biologically die, and, uh, and then we continue afterwards, what's going to continue? Energy is going to continue. Our mind is going to continue. Our energy, not our physical biological body, as we know, that has died. Um, but what continues to live in my experience is this energy that we call con- our con- individual consciousness, our mind, soul, spirit, whatever. So I, ca- I call it our mind, it continuum, but you know, our big mind, whatever. My, what's my individual conscious thinking mind as well as my, my, my vast mind. It's a fluid thing. It's not two parts. It's not three parts. It's not eight parts. It's a fluid thing, our consciousness, right? So, um, that continues. If that continues, that's energy, right? So that matches up with the first law of thermodynamics, which is energy can't be created or destroyed. So it just takes on a different form. So now we're taking on a different form in the afterlife, let's say, as an identifiable energy pattern. That's the way I define it because that's been my experience. On the other side, you can identify other beings as, and, and even personalities, loved ones. Uh, I, I have a, a, a number of clients a uh, great number, uh, many clients who have had dead children uh, predecease the parents, or parents uh, lost their parents, et cetera, so forth. You know, or, or adults lost their parents, so forth, both ways. And yet, and they've had communications with those loved ones on the other side. How do they know? Well, how do they know it's them? Well, there's a personality, there's a there's a uniqueness either to the languaging or to the smell or the feel, or sometimes they even get tactile touches from people on the other side, and it's unique. There's a uniqueness to them. It's an identifiable. So I call it an identifiable energy pattern that we continue to have on the other side. Um, I've visually seen uh, people who have died and so forth, and then after they show me uh, who they are, then I can feel their presence and know who they are without seeing them visually anymore. So identifiable energy pattern is a phrase that I came up with as a result. But... Um, so we're on the other side. If we are energy, um, then how can we describe um, the other side in terms, in earth terms that we might be able to understand? So I thought about this and I thought if we're energy and we can travel really fast as energy on the other side, I know that from experience, various experience says that we can travel incredibly fast on the other side. What can we use as a teaching? What can I use as a teaching example on planet Earth, what is energy that's measurable? Light. Light is measurable as energy on planet Earth. So I thought, hmm, I'll g- Wikipedia this. How fast is the speed of light? And I looked it up, and whatever the exact figure is, it's something like 692,600,000 miles per hour. So round that off to 700 million miles per hour. That's the speed of light in our known universe on this side of the veil, Okay. On planet Earth, Mars, Venus, you know, our universe, our Milky Way galaxy, etc. In our known universe. 700 million miles per hour. To give people a sense for how fast that is. That's eight times around the planet, the equator of Earth, in one second. So you can get around the equator, the fattest wow. part of the Earth, 24,000 square miles. I mean, 24,000 miles. Um, in in one-eighth of a second... That's crazy fast. So let's say you can travel 700 million miles per hour on the other side. I don't know how fast, but let's just say for sake of argument. That means that you can travel so fast that an earthling would be fooled and be easily be easily be fooled to think that you can be in two places at the same time. 700 million miles per hour, okay? Because let's say I'm talking to you, Tim, and I'm dead. I'm on the other side, and you're in Tokyo. And then I go to talk to one of my kids in Paris. 
and they call you up because they let's say they got your cell phone number. They call you up and you're in Tokyo. And they say, you go, Dad just called me. And Tim says, oh, Kelvin just called me. Oh, he must be in two places at the same time. That's I think that's where that conflation and confusion can come from. Because that, yeah. you guys think I just talked to you each at the same time. Meanwhile, you do the math, what it is, Tokyo to Paris, let's just say, whatever the mile is, is the mileage is, I think it works out to about a 64th of a second if I'm traveling at 700 million miles per hour. Yeah, you had time to stop and grab a sandwich on your way. Exactly. I had plenty of time. <laughs> so then, yeah, I mean, and that can also explain why, uh, if you look at things from, you know, the, the, the type of research that I do, the paranormal research I do, why, why, why a spirit can reach out and talk to us, but it doesn't mean that they're trapped on earth. You know, they're just because they're yeah. here and interacting with us, uh, doesn't mean that they're, they're earthbound. No, no, no. They, 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 there's, they, it, there, the afterlife is right here. So that's a, also a common conflation, and in, in you're pointing that out exactly right, because people think that they're here because we're here. Well, we are here on planet Earth, and you're just experiencing the afterlife, which is also right here. It's not far away. It's right here. It's just it's, it's vibrating at a different frequency. You can't see it. You can't feel you know, Most people can't feel it. I can see it sometimes, and I can see into it sometimes, but most people can't. But it's right here. So, they, so you then you get the conflation, like you say. People say, "Oh, that they're right here. They're ghosts on Earth. No, 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 whatever. They just, you know, they're yeah. in the afterlife." Whatever. I think I, I think I fell into the heaven and the clouds above us trap for a second there, you know, <laughs> and, and 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 that's what's gr that's what's great about this because now it makes sense with what you're talking about about you know being able to not even having to be on this planet necessarily. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's no. Once we, in my, my, in my experience anyway, this is my theory on this, is why can I and some people, I'm not the only person, of course, but there are, there, there are a minority of people on the, on the planet, <clears throat> but there's, 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 there's millions of people like myself who can connect with the other side very easily. Why is that? I think it's because fears are not there. And you break down the fear barrier, and I think people can open up to that. And so that's one thing that I help people do is break down their fears and so forth for those people who want to communicate with their dead loved ones, et cetera. But, but it's not, it, I think that's the, that's, that's the thing that's keeping us from, you, you know, you know, the phrase, the veil, you know, the veil, the right. veil is a phrase, V E I L. People call it, you know, going through the veil or can you see through the veil or can you experience through the veil to the afterlife or heaven or whatever. That's just a phrase because for most people, it's so foggy clouded you know, an experience because of the various fears and baggage that people have. But once you clear that up, it's just, it's very, it's seamless. There's no fogginess. It's like, it's a matter of how can you, how can you decrease the cloudiness, so to speak, increase the clarity, and then the seamlessness uh, between here and there, you, you see it, you start to experience that, oh yeah, it's, 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 there, there is no, it's right here. It's just operating at a different frequency. Yeah, and that's why people who do that kind of work, like you're talking about, people that are, you know, spirit communicators, they're they're people right. that don't have to deal with that veil. They don't have to deal yeah. with that because there is no there is no cloudiness around them. Exactly, there's no veil there. Really, it's just a term that people come up with, and it's and it's kind of cloudy. I think it's just a term of art, you know. And and yeah. and, and having the that ability to be able to do that. And clear that veil away. Does it? Does it clear up other things as well? Does it? Does it, is it just a matter of life versus death, or or is that fog kind of permeating and keeping us from being able to see other things too, like other other abilities that you could have or things like that? Well, not only other abilities, but let's just we, we can go there in a second. But let's just keep it the planet Earth for a second. Uh, not only that, but 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 living life more fully here in the present on planet Earth, which is what I'm all about. Because, yes, I have this ability and so forth and so on. But to me, I'm Kelvin Chin, and I've always passed life memories over. But I'm here in the present. I'm in 2020. I'm fully, I'm fully bought in <laughs> to living my life here and enjoying life here on planet Earth in the continual present. That's what I encourage people to do. So um, the, the side effect to your question of getting rid of our fears is the ability to have more transverse experience so to speak from here to there but but more immediately it improves the quality quality of our life here and now because we get rid of all of our fears 
or, or as many of our fears as we can, more of our fears, it's relative, nobody's perfect, but the more fears we can get rid of, the more happy we're going to be, my opinion. The more, the more of us is available to live our lives and to share with our loved ones and our friends and our workers and our, you know, whatever, our community, et cetera. So it's, it has an immediate practical benefit in the here and the now. And yes, it also has a side effect benefit in terms of opening us up to the other side. So when I'm working with people, for example, Tim, when I'm working with people, you know, in my meditation classes, I don't know. I don't necessarily get into afterlife stuff with people because some people are just athletes and they they want to learn from me because they want to reduce their 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 healing time, their downtime, being off the field. You know, uh, they're not into afterlife stuff. But those people who are into both, I'll talk to them just like what I just said to you. Is it, it going to help you here and now? And if you want to communicate with loved ones in the afterlife, that 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 could be a side effect. There's no guarantees. We don't know. Everybody's. Sure. Fear levels and openness and so forth to the other side is, it varies, but certainly the tool can provide you that kind of access. All right. Well, we're going to take our next break. When we come back on the other side, we're going to get into some of Kelvin's past life experiences and we'll talk more about some of these after death communications as well. We'll also take your questions. 508-322-1985. Email Tim at midnight.fm or post them in the Midnight Society Facebook group. If you would like to jump in there and chat, Tracy starts the thread each and every afternoon and it's pinned right to the top of the group so that you never have to look far for it. We'll be back with more Midnight Society in just a few moments here on Midnight.fm. That's 508-322-1985 or Skype midnight.fm. And welcome back. We are talking tonight with Kelvin Chin about experiences on the other side. And we, we've started talking a little bit about what the other side is like. But you know, Kelvin, before we get into the process and the reincarnation and the fact that people can choose to stay on the other side for a while and all that, we should probably talk a little bit about the process itself of what happens when we die. For example, uh, Nancy emails in and says, you know, she's not afraid of death. She's afraid of the process of dying. And, yeah. and it is, it can be different for everybody, of course, because sometimes it's quick, sometimes it's dragged out. But once you reach that point where, your physical body here has expired. What what happens to us from that point on? Yeah, it, it, it's 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 very um, actually comfortable and comforting. I would say to Nancy, that's the first thing to keep in mind. It's a very comfortable and comforting experience. There, first of all, um, you know how into this COVID nineteen thing. I'm actually speaking at a conference, uh, an IONS conference in August. International Association for Near Death Studies on a, on a panel, and we're going to talk about this topic about uh, it's called Healing Perspectives on Dying Alone. People can look this up online uh, or go to my website and they'll see it. But um, the point is that we're going to talk about that people don't die alone. Uh, you know how COVID nineteen people, visitors, families, and so forth are not allowed in the hospital room with people, even when they're dying. So people are holding up their smartphones or their tablets. The doctors and nurses are holding it up for the people to say goodbye and so forth, which is, you know, a very difficult and somewhat, you know, a very traumatic and horrible right. thing, but understandable why they're doing this. But my point is to point out to people, we never die alone. There are loved ones who greet us, Nancy, on the other side when you die. There are many, 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 Dozens, maybe even hundreds, depending on uh, the situation, of of lots of people who come to 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 meet you. 
dead loved ones who've predeceased you. Um, plus, there are other beings whose job it is, in fact, to help with the transition uh, from this physical, earthly realm, we'll call it, to heaven. And so the acclimation process, getting used to it and so forth and pointing out how, oh, you don't have a body. You don't have a physical, biological any, body anymore. But, oh, by the way, you, you can still kind of see energy fields and so forth. And you see energy patterns of people. You see energy of people and so forth. And they can take on a form of energy, just like a light body, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very seamless, smooth experience. Very various people will, you know, have different um, types of experience when they leave their physical body. For some people, they're just on the other side. For other people, they're sometimes experience what's referred to as a tunnel of light, which is just uh, it seems like it's a tunnel. I think it's a figurative figure of speech that people will use where they it feels as if you're kind of going down a tunnel because what you're doing is you're transitioning. Your soul, your spirit, your consciousness, and what I'm referring to as your mind is transitioning from f- this dense physical reality that we live in here on planet Earth to the afterlife or heaven. And so in that transition, you're transitioning from what to what? You're transitioning from a field of dense uh, physical reality here to a field of energy. And what does energy look like to to us uh, earthlings, humans, we'll say, is is it looks like light. And so as you get uh, approach it, as you transition towards it more and more, closer and closer to it, it's as if you're going down a tunnel because you're going towards a brighter and brighter, and eventually it's just everything is bright, is bright and lit up. Energy, it's energetic, the field on, in heaven. Um, and so... Um, but it's a very smooth thing. It, it, there's lots of helpers and loved ones and friends who come to greet you. To and, and, and there are many, many stories. I talk about this in my book uh, about stories of people coming and so forth and, and guiding people, etc. And um, it, it's it's a very, very common experience. Those of uh, listeners have probably helped. Some of your listeners have probably helped people or been in the room pre-COVID-19 when they were dying, either in the hospital or at home or wherever. Um, and they've said things like, well, I can see, oh, there's grandpa or there's grandmother or there's, um, you know, Uncle Uncle Tom or Uncle Bill or, you know, Aunt Susan or whatever, Dee Dee, et cetera. So people can see them while they're still in their physical body, alive on planet Earth, in their physical biological body, can start to see through the veil that we were talking about earlier, Tim, into the other side, that facility, that ability starts to happen. And it's very normal for people who are close to death because they're already, their soul, their spirit, their consciousness is already starting to transition in the, what sometimes re- people refer to as the deathing process. Not just the dying part, but the deathing. It's like it, they're getting closer and closer to death. Mm. Physical, biological death. Well, we, we also have a call on the line. Uh, we can go to that. We'll take that next. And then I have another sure. question that's come in as well. Uh, good evening. You're on Midnight Society with Kelvin Chin. Hello. What's shaking, playboy? Oh, Lamone. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Just living and loving, trying to deal with the heat. It's going to be 112 degrees tomorrow in Vegas. It's going to be 113 the day after that. I'm sorry to hear that. So, you know, so, I'm, so I'm going to be black and crisp. So I'm going to you, though. I'm going to let the brother know. All right. Do you, do you have a question for Kelvin? Well, hey, Kelvin, nice name. Sound like a black guy's name, Kelvin. Okay. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. People mistake yeah, exactly. me. Exactly. I'm, yeah, I'm the ethnic enigma. They think I'm, that people often think that I am mixed. Well, Lamone, you got to turn down whatever you're listening on. I'm listening to you guys. I know, but I can, uh, I can hear, I, I can hear it. You got to turn it down. I turned it down all the, I turned it all the ball. Okay. So yeah. So we're finally able to get to it. So yeah. All the bell. So, oh, yeah. So what were you saying, Kelvin? What were you saying again? Oh, I just you saying, said something uh, that people think I'm mixed. Uh, it's, I'm you, mixed. you were saying that sounds like I have a black name. But, um, yeah, so, so do you have a question, though? Yeah, well, I'm, I got a couple things there. Like, I've got some experiences with, uh, you know, I've been there with people passed on, and, and I've had, like, a near-death experience a couple times myself. 
Mm-hmm. And that's a whole different story. So that was like, you know, that was kind of scary. But well, it wasn't scary, but it was like, it was, it could have been scary. But it was like, there's so many things going on with that. But I'd like, I'd like to hear how you, how you've done, how you, how you went through that yourself and how it was difficult for you. Was it hard for you when you first had your, 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 your death experience? I remember almost drowning when I was like, before I was like four, five years old. And that was my first experience. But I had, I had an angel come to me. And she was like, she pulled, all right, you know, even like, I was on a military base. You know how they have the big, long Olympic swimming pools there? You know, yeah. they have the, have you been to a military base? Okay, so they have like, I, I, yeah, I have actually that, taught, taught meditation on military bases. Yeah. You, oh, well, that's a good place to do it. They all need a little bit of something to get them to think a little, a little different. So, all right, yeah. I was like in a little pool that's like maybe like two feet, you know, two feet high and deep. And I, was, I got over to the big pool, all the big kids were going on. And so all of a sudden, I was like, yeah, I put my hand on the side of the pool and started going around. All of a sudden, my hand slipped. And I was under the water, and I was like, Ooh, and I was like looking at the sun. And it was like so clear, like I could reach out and grab it. And it was, I was starting to get dark. I was closing my eyes. And all of a sudden, this girl pulled me out, out of the pool. And she and I said, oh, she said, you know you're too small doing that pool. She said, I said, my name is, she said, what's your name? I said, my name is Lamont. She said, my name is, my name is Elizabeth. I said, oh, that's And I said, you know you didn't do that. So what I did, I wiped my eyes and said, she was gone. And so she went, and so I, I got a certain predilection for dark haired women. She had dark hair and women, a black bikini. Just so this, you know, and it, it was like, and it was like, it was like the first time. But when I've met other people, the children and stuff that have had near death experiences, the people that were younger and near near death experiences, they all come to the, the person that met them was a, was a angel named Elizabeth. And oh, so very, and very interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and so now it's like you know, so, yeah, and so it's like I don't know about other people, but this is like I want to say like maybe. 15, 20 different people in my lifetime that I've come across that had the same name. I didn't tell them the name, I let them say it themselves. And I was like, okay. And so, and I think that's a good thing to think about. So Elizabeth, oh, she was beautiful. Like, you know, she's she kind of skinny, you know, in the bikini. I like it was a little thicker, but like I said, you know, I'm not going to go there. Like I said, oh, but I wasn't like, you know, I was five years old. I wasn't even thinking about things I shouldn't have been thinking about. Uh, but this is a different let's, story now. Yeah, let's okay. bring it back around, Lamone here. <laughs> okay, so yeah. So, um, so what do you think about this? About this COVID stuff, have you met people? You talked about people dealing with people dying or, or near death. With that oh I've yeah, oh yeah, people. yeah. Why don't you? Why don't I answer your first question and talk about the what? my near death experience you're, you're, you asked me about? I say you heard one. So yeah, yeah. He was asking about my near death experience and then you know how what it was like. And, and interestingly enough, I also almost drowned, but it was different experience from from yours because you were asking me. Uh, whether or not, you know, I was afraid when it happened to me, like you, because you said you were afraid when you had that near death experience where you almost drowned when you were four or five years old. It happened to me when I was about 20 years old. And, um, the interesting thing, uh, from, from, from my experience, Ramon, was that I had already been meditating for two years before I had my near drowning experience off of the coast of San Diego. So I was, those people, uh, listeners who in that area, Southern California, know uh, uh, Black's Beach, which is part of Torrey Pines uh, Park there in La Jolla. And there's beautiful beach, so forth. I'd never been to the West Coast before. I was doing an intensive summer language uh, program for eight or ten weeks there. And I met uh, another student in my uh, language program, and, I, and she was also from the East Coast. So I said, "Let's go to the beach because you know class don't start till tomorrow or the next day." So we went to so we went to the beach, and we'd never been to that part of the West. We'd never been to the West Coast, and that in that part in Southern California, there's lots of rip currents, and so I didn't know that. We went in, got in the water. It was a hot June day, uh, 1972, and I lifted my feet up. Maybe I was you know, waist deep, hip deep in the water, something like that, lifted my feet up. The next thing I knew, about 30, 40 seconds later, I mean, I wasn't timing it, but uh, I, 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 about a little while later, I was about 1.7 miles out. I asked a friend of mine who's a ship captain, and I said those those cliffs at Torrey Pines Beach were about, you know, they're 300 foot tall, you know, b- uh, cl- cliffs. How, if I saw them and they were about three inches tall, how far out was I? And he said, you were about 1.7 miles out. So I was way out very fast. And my friend, she must have been standing on the edge of the rip current. And she was 
way back at the shore. She didn't get pulled out like I did. So a rip current is like a river in the ocean. And it goes, you know, it comes into the shore and it gets close to the shore and then wings out into the ocean. Well, I got pulled out and, of course, I panicked. I didn't uh, remember any of my Boy Scout training, Tim. And I, and I, I swam directly towards, <laughs> towards the cliffs, which is exactly against the current. And I got exhausted. You're supposed to swim at a 45 degree angle to the shore. So to increase the likelihood you're going to get out of the rip current. But instead I panicked. I forgot all about that. And I, and I just got exhausted and I started going down. So just like you, Ramon, I started going down in the water, except I'm in the ocean and I start to see the surface of the water getting farther away from me. I'm holding my breath. But what happened was because I'd been meditating, this is, in retrospect, Monday morning quarterbacking, looking back at it, I think because I'd been meditating already for two years, I was already very familiar with being out of my body, or at least being uh, my mind being separate from my body in a, in a very distinct way through many, many, many meditations. I'd been meditating twice a day, uh, sometimes more than twice a day, for, for, for two years at that point, over two years. So by the time, uh, you know, I had this almost drowning experience, when my mind left my body for a split second, it was not a, an oh wow, oh gee whiz, like oh crazy experience for me. It was like, a, oh, ho-hum, okay, I get it. Except I wasn't ho-hum because I was freaking out. I thought I was going to drown. But, but the experience of my mind leaving my body was not an overwhelming experience. It was a very normal experience for me. And so I realized what was going on. My mind was starting to leave my body, and I thought, oh, whoa, this is happening? <laughs> this is not meditation. I am almost drowning. So I, I, I immediately decided to will my mind back into my body and to change my attitude towards the whole thing and to stop trying to swim in so fast and to just chill out. And all of those thoughts that I just said to you just right there, Tim, happened in a millisecond. It was just kind of a all came at once together, wow. all at once knowing and so by then, maybe I'm only five or six feet underwater. If I had, if it had taken a long time uh, to get to that point, you know, I would have been 12, 15 feet down. It would have been too far for me to swim back up. I would not have made it. But I forced myself back to the surface, flipped over on my back. Uh, of course, then a wave went over me, and I realized, well, that's not a good position to be in. And I swam in doing side stroke, keeping my head above water the whole time. So I wouldn't drink, take on any water and, you know, suck down any water into my lungs. And it took me an hour to swim back in. I crawled back up on shore. I was exhausted. And my friend, she said I slept for about a half an hour, passed out. She said it took wow. me about an hour to get back in. Well, thank you very much for the call, Lamone. And uh, by the way, Lamone's catchphrase, what's shaking playboy? That might actually be even more applicable than normal next week. And that's all I can say. You're going to have to wait for Sunday when we release the lineup for next week's show. But I will say that uh, What's Shaken Playboy will probably be more apropos than ever next Friday. And that's all I will say about that. You'll have to wait for Sunday to find out the rest of it. Well, that's, a great, that's a great tease. <laughs> 508-322-1985 is the number if you would like to call in. Anybody else that wants to uh, share an experience or ask a question. But we do have a question that came in uh, via Discord that came in from Ryman. And I just want to pull that up. Give me one second here. Uh, mm -hmm. He asked if, eh, give me one second here. I'm rolling through it. If, if trauma from a previous life could affect you in a future life, and if you would have any examples of that. Absolutely, yes. Oh, I got some examples for sure. Uh, so personal examples and uh, examples from close friends of mine as well. Yes. The short answer is definitely yes, absolutely yes. Uh, trauma from previous life. In fact, um, many of my clients have un, inexplicable fears, whether they be about death or dying or other fears that are not explainable in this, out of this lifetime. Um, and, and it's definitely from other lifetimes, but I've had, I've had trauma from other lifetimes affect me in this lifetime. Actually, I had a, um, I should give you a short example of a friend of mine was stabbed in the back. He remembers being stabbed in the back. Um, in 4,000 years ago in, uh, Egypt, I think. And, um, he remembers the incident. He remembers the family members. He remembers who did it, et cetera. 
And he's still this in this lifetime, in the 20th century, 2020, the first century lifetime now um, had up until recently a pain in his back right where he could feel where the the knife went in. And so we can carry around these kind of emotional, I call them emotional impressions or emotional scars that that don't necessarily have a physical scar with them, but they're emotionally there and they have a physical component to them. So that's one example. Um, I'll give you another example um, of myself. So I have this past life memory from 330 BC. So that's about 2300 years ago um, where I was a Carthaginian slave. I was African. So I've pretty much been all races on the planet. I've had lifetimes from all races. In other words, over the last 6,000 years that I, out of the 25 or so lifetimes that I have memories of, I've been all the races. In this one, I was African. I was very, very dark black skin. You know that color people sometimes refer to as blue black? Mm-hmm. I was very, it was that black. And I remember seeing my skin in this uh, experience that I had started in, this one I had from, ni- my past life memory started in 1977 this lifetime. Uh, but this one is from about 1979, where I was a Carthaginian slave and a uh, very traumatic experience because I was dying. I didn't die, but I was dying on a piece of wreckage on what I thought at the time was the ocean because I couldn't see any land. It was a big body of water. I couldn't see any land. But this is a great um, teaching example for everybody to show how you can get tidbits of these memories, and you may uh, not be able to actually piece together all the jigsaw puzzles together, pieces together till much later. So first I thought I was just on the ocean. I was on a piece of wreckage, maybe like the size of, uh, I don't know, a dining room table or two dining room tables, big, you know, holding on to it. Could feel the warm water lapping up on my feet every once in a while. At first it was just a vision. I knew I was dying. And then I got more pieces, and I could get sensations. I felt the water on my foot. I could feel the heat of the sun. I could feel how hungry and thirsty I was because I don't know how long I was on this piece of wreckage, uh, but, uh, you know, long enough to be really like starving and incredibly thirsty, etc. So I'd probably been on there for days, I'm guessing. Um, but then I started having some visions of um, the ship. And so this is another teaching example. I, I tell people, I say, follow the, follow the breadcrumbs. So I started following the breadcrumbs. I looked up what this ship looked like. Oh, that's that ship. Oh, that's interesting. So, so first I, first I knew I was rowing in a ship. Then I saw the ship. So first I knew I was rowing. So I knew I was probably not the 16th, 17th, 18th century, not the 19th century. This is old, old. And it felt really old. Um, rowing on a ship in battle, in a war, explosions are going on. People would throw like tar onto, you know, they, you know, th- throw a bucket of tar over on you and then throw a torch or shoot a lit arrow and blow your shit up, ship up. That was commonplace back, you know, 2000 years ago, 2300 years ago. Uh, and, and then I realized what the ship was. It was a Carthaginian ship. We were fighting the Romans. The Romans had a unique kind of ship at the time. Um, and, and it was, so it was not the Roman ship. I was on a Carthaginian. I knew I was a slave. And we had gotten blown up. So I figured out by connecting the breadcrumb pieces, following the breadcrumbs, that it was probably 2300 years ago in 330 BC, probably the Punic Wars. But here's, uh, to your questioner's point, here's the, what I took out of this traumatic experience that still I remember today, um, is, uh, in 1979, I started remembering this and I got more and more bits and pieces over the 1980s and the 90s and so forth. 1990s, is I, I remembered my willpower. That's what I remembered primarily out of this whole horrific, powerful, intense emotional experience of almost dying, uh, having gotten blown up and, you know, I was on a, my, my ship getting blown up, but I was, uh, whole on a, on a piece of wreckage, you know, um, uh, not that injured evidently, but starving and, dre- and almost dying of thirst and being roasted literally on the Mediterranean. Then I figured out, oh, it was the Mediterranean, even though I couldn't see the shore, right? Because that's where the battles were going on, the Carthaginians and the Romans. Well, um, uh, I willed myself to stay alive. That's the message to you, this caller. As I took this as a lesson to help me learn from this 23-year 
hundred year old experience, this memory to help me today as Kelvin Chin in 20, well, in this case, you know, in whatever it was, 1979, 1980, 1990, to help me, my willpower, access my willpower, the strength of my mind and help me through five layoffs. I've been laid off five times since I was 50 years old. Those, any of your people, the people who call, you know, on the, in the audience who been laid off, you know how difficult it is when you get laid off to try to get a new job. And then if you're over 45, 50 years old, forget about it, right? Age discrimination. Right. Those of you who have been in that situation, you know what I'm talking about. They, you never, you, you, you cannot file a claim of age discrimination because they just never call you, right? But you know you're experienced enough and you know you, you, you know, you're qualified and so forth and you never get a call. You know, there's a lot of age discrimination that goes on in the United States and, uh, and it's just under the radar. Well, I had to deal with that five times. Imagine that 50 years old, 54, 58, 60 years old. I had to deal with that five times. Well, that lifetime, 2300 years ago, saved my life this lifetime multiple times because of the willpower that I had. I drew from that experience to stay alive. And in this case, not literally, but to stay alive financially well when we come back we're going to take a break here when we come back on the other side i do have a question from lucia that we will ask uh that came in the midnight society we can also take your questions again 508-322-1985 but i also want to get into the idea of how you discover these past life experiences and how you you work out all the details of them so we'll find out all about that as well and when we come back on the other side too we'll also dive into the idea of you know what do we learn about these and and are, are these past life experiences designed to have us learn as kelvin's saying for something that we can apply to future lives. So we'll talk about all of that and more. And again, if you have any questions or if you've had experiences, you can give us a call at 508-322-1985 or you can email me, Tim, at midnight.fm. The other way is also to post it in the Midnight Society Facebook group or if you're a member at midnight.fm, then you can post it if you're a member at the elite level or the insider level you can post it in the discord server uh, there's always some folks in there chatting and it can happen any time of day and we'll also have it going not only during midnight society and during the rebroadcast of spooky south coast that we run the rest of the time but also it'll be going tomorrow night or sunday morning depending on where you live during mac maloney's military x files there is a room right in there in the Discord server for Mac Maloney's Military X-Files, so jump in there and chat during the program tomorrow night. We'll be back with more Midnight Society in just a moment here on Midnight.fm. With more Midnight Society here on Midnight.fm. Tonight we are talking with Kelvin Chin about experiences on the other side. And if, by the way, if you'd like to find out more about Kelvin, if you'd like to pick up his book, Overcoming the Fear of Death Through Each of the Four Main Belief Systems, if you'd like to find out more about Turning Within, you can find all the relevant links right at Midnight.fm. It's that, it's that way for each and every one of our guests every night. If you just go to the website, midnight.fm, and when you go there, you will see right on the main page there, tonight's guest, and you can click on their photo that will take you over to the page that we have set up for them that has their bio, the info about tonight's show, and all of the relevant links so that you can follow our guests on social media, order their books, go to their websites, all of that. So you can do that right by going to midnight.fm, and the best part about it is when you click on it, it doesn't take you out of the website. So all those links are set up so that when you click on them, it opens up in a different window so that you don't have to lose the program if you are listening live as it's going on. And when you buy a book 
from our guests from Midnight.fm. Not only does it help our guests out by putting some money in their pocket, of course, we know Amazon's going to make all the money, but not only do they get something from the sale, but it actually helps us. It helps us continue on with Midnight.fm and with Midnight Society, even if you're not going to be buying the guest book, and I don't know why you wouldn't. It's right there. But uh, if you're buying something else through Amazon, use our website. Use that portal as a way to get into Amazon. We'll even get a little bit of money if you do that as well, and it helps us keep things going. So Midnight.fm is the website, and also follow us on social media, because as I mentioned before, each Sunday we release on Facebook and on Twitter the lineup of the guests for the upcoming week. So that way there you can plan your week ahead, which shows you want to listen to live and which shows you want to grab a subscription at midnight.fm for uh, to be able to listen to later on. And I'm taking a look at next week's lineup right now. And we're going to be talking about things such as energy, biofields, mind-body practices. We're going to be talking about alien experiencers, but taking kind of a, a, a forest for the trees approach, uh, we're going to be talking about some of the cases that you may be familiar with, but also a new way of looking at them. We're going to be talking about grief and loss. We're going to be talking, well, we had to do it. We're going to be talking about some haunted hotels, some hotel paranormal. And as I mentioned, Lamone's catchphrase of what's shaking playboy will become very relevant next Friday night. And I'll have all the information about that on Sunday. Just follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, it's facebook.com slash midnight dotfm. And on Twitter, it's at midnight dotfm. And you will know as soon as we put it out there what the lineup is all about for next week. But we still have plenty to cover and discuss tonight with Kelvin Chin. And Kelvin, I had mentioned before the break that we had a question that came in from Lucia. She wants to know as we're talking about the transition to death or, or to the other side, I should say, and people that are on the other side and being reincarnated and spirits and all of that. She wants to know how the shadow people phenomena plays into all of this. What does she mean by that? So within paranormal research, there is a, a lot of experiences. I've had numerous ones myself of these shadow figures that appear in places. They're not quite ghosts they're not quite fully formed apparitions but they're just a shadow that's moving uh through through a particular place we actually describe it as the shadow is darker than the darkness around it so you see this humanoid figure this black shadowy mass that's in the shape of a person and, and it will interact with you but yet it's not what you would consider to typically be a spirit yeah so i'm, I'm not familiar with those they don't communicate with me I don't have experience with them, so I really can't speak to that directly. I, I can conjecture what I think, uh, but I don't have direct experience with those. So I've never talked to any of them, that kind of thing, if that's what you're asking. Sure. I mean, and, and I've, I've had a few experiences myself where I've been led to believe that it's really just a spirit that hasn't fully formed you know, it doesn't have enough energy. And then in other cases, I think that it might be something completely different. But, you know, that's we, we can table that uh, for another well, time. I can talk to you about that issue. It, 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 there's, spirits don't get fully formed. So that's a, that's, a, that's a figure of speech that sometimes people use in the paranormal. Mm -hmm. But a mind is a mind is a mind. So a mind is a mind. Do they choose to show you uh, who they are because they're comfortable within themselves? So here's the thing. There's less difference between the other side and this side than most people realize. So just keep that phrase in mind. So what does that mean? We take our minds with us. Those minds who are fear-ridden, and I suspect that those minds that you're describing have fear within them. So they're not, in a sense, you're, you, the phrase that you're using is fully formed, but they're, 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 they're fully formed minds, but they're, but they're, not, they're not expressing themselves fully. Okay. And so, um, it, because of what? Because of fear. Something's holding them back. So are there uh, beings, are there dead people who, uh, and here's, there's this whole notion also in this area, when people talk about people, be, souls getting stuck. Nobody gets stuck in the sense of being stuck by some external structure. People get stuck or minds get stuck uh, or they may not be in your, your parlance fully formed because of fear. And so what I do in all my work is help people reduce their fears about everything. 
whether they're on this side or the other side. Look, in my meditation classes, sometimes I get a glimpse into the other side. There's a hundred people in my meditation class on the other side taking my meditation class. So, you know, there's people in physical form on planet Earth <laughs> taking my meditation class. There are people on the other side taking my meditation class at the same time. And so fears we take with us. And so those who have a lot of fear after they die kind of can kind of sort of get stuck. But this, this not, they're not getting stuck because of some external force that's making them stuck. They're getting stuck because of their own internal forces, their own internal fears. That's what I mean by forces. The internal fears and their lack of clarity about, you know, what happens with it when they die. People who are really, really, really like, you know, I, 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 this is it. You know, I'm not, I'm not letting go. Uh, I don't want to let go of this physical reality. They can hang on and hang out here. And that's a choice that they make. So this goes to the whole free willness, free will of our universe that we're all free will thinking minds. That includes the minds that you guys are talking about that, you know, shadow whatever you phrase you use that I'm not familiar with. But th that's that's what that is. They are minds as well. They are minds who can make choices and they have made choices that 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 keep them in some whatever place you want to however you want to label it. But it all distills down to one thing. That's why to, to our discussion earlier, Tim, about the idea of fear I'm not a proponent that fear is a positive thing. Fear is what fuels those types of ghosts who are stuck. I've had experience with ghosts in houses here. And I talked to them. And I said, look, don't worry. We're only staying here overnight. This is your place, blah, blah, blah. It was a vacant house that a friend of ours had across the street from their, the house that they lived in. And my, my, my wife and I just slept in it overnight. And we said, look, we'll leave it the way, you know, don't worry about it. And they immediately became, were quiet. They were moving furniture in the attic. There was nobody in the in this vacant house besides me and my wife sleeping up on the second floor. But up in the attic, they were moving couches, beds, huge pieces of furniture, six, eight feet across the wooden attic floor. That's, that's pretty intense. Very intense for about 10 minutes straight. And then I just had the I was like 26 years old at the time. And I had the presence of mind to just say, you know what? It's OK. This is your place. We're not moving in. Don't worry. They were quiet immediately. Then not a peep from them the rest of the night. And then we came back and I told them, we're, we're just going to use it for our wedding reception because we were paying for the whole thing and our friend was letting us use it. And they, oh, we're going to use it. We'll clean it up, blah, blah, blah. Nothing weird happened during the wedding reception. Nothing. Well, I, you know, I always say that I wish, I'm, I'm glad there, there are no ghosts or spirits in my house, but I could actually use some because I have to move a couch. And so if they want to come and <laughs> exactly. give me a hand, it's hard when you're by yourself, you know, it's a, you know, I can move a chair, a table even, but you know, the couch exactly. is just a little more like, a yeah, for some reason it was no problem moving big furniture with these, you know, disparate, uh, you know, beings, disincarnate beings, whatever, you know, and <laughs> That's it, funny. I just want to ask a quick uh, follow-up question to Ryman's question from, from the last segment. Uh, yeah. he wants to know if, you know, talking about how you can carry over from, from one life to the other, he wants to know if mm -hmm. there are previous life experiences that you could have that mm -hmm. in your current life could cause you to have anxiety issues or is, or is the anxiety more related to the current life that we're living? No, you can carry anxieties from other lifetimes to this lifetime. Absolutely. For sure. I talk about one example in the book. So if people are curious about these kinds of things, past lives, Go to the University of Virginia web, medical school website, University of Virginia. It's one of the top schools in the country, University of Virginia medical school website, and just type in in their search window, past lives. I can't remember the exact name of the, uh, it's like the Division of Perceptual Studies or something like that. That could be it. But there's a, there's a department within the medical school at the University of Virginia. They've been researching these things since 1961. And the department was created in 1967, um, and um, and they've researched somewhere close to 3,000 cases they have documented of children, generally between the ages of two to five, maybe two to seven years old. And uh, example to what you know the uh, caller is asking about specifically, one uh, example, for example, that I talk about in my book is a, a young boy. Um, He's a Caucasian boy living in Louisiana, 
uh, fundamentalist father, uh, Christian father does not believe in past lives, okay, at all. And, um, and then in, in, in this little boy is sitting in, um, on his mom's lap while his mom is putting on, uh, makeup. And, um, said, Oh, I had earrings like this. Oh, I had earrings like that. Whatever, you know. Uh, and, and she so she thinks he's just making stories up. Kid's two years old, right? Saying this two year old, three year old. And then next gives more information, more information, more data comes out. Cur- I used to have curly hair. I was a woman. I came down and I became your child and you call me so and so, whatever his name was. And you and dad named me such and such, but I used to be called this and that. A name was Pam. And so, and, and while he was a little baby, all his, his toy, toy uh, turtle was named Pam. His, his little plastic truck that he used to ride on was named Pam. He named everything Pam. Well, it turns out the woman has enough data points after, I don't know, eight months, ten months, or whatever, a year of this. She, she starts looking up, uh, there's this woman, and, he, and she said, what, what, what color was your skin? Because she finds out he's telling her, that he used to take a train, an elevated train, uh, all the time. Well, where is that? Well, there's elevated trains in Chicago. So she says, uh, wait, wait, what, what, what color was your skin? And he said, black. He goes, duh, black. It's like a four-year-old now. It's like this couple of years later. And uh, she researches this, and he's really scared, to your caller's point, he's incredibly scared about heights and fire. Heights and fire in this lifetime. This is like happened in like 2012 or something like that. Okay. Uh, recently. And, um, I think you can even Google this. It might be on the lifetime channel or something about this kid. Anyway, um, uh, he, um, she, her mom researches this a black woman named Pam Robinson died. And I can't remember 1992 or something like this in a, a Chicago fire jumping out of a f- fifth story, uh, window of a hotel in a black, uh, black neighborhood in Chicago. So then her, the mom's like, what? And so she looks this up. She calls up the woman's still living mother. Pam Robinson's mother is still alive. Calls her up, tells her this stuff, blah, blah, blah. They get together. Turns out the mom tells the, the mo- Pam Robinson, who's deceased, tells this woman, um, uh, the mother of the child, that Pam was really into um, Stevie Wonder music and played keyboards in a band. And this little boy has been carrying around a Fisher-Price little toy keyboard everywhere, wow. and he's 100% into Stevie Wonder. How many little two, three, four-year-olds who in 2012 are into Stevie Wonder? Right. And if it's one thing that's a, that's a similarity, that's, you know, that's one thing. But when it starts to be multiple things that start to tie in together, you, you really can't, yeah, you have to look at it with a, a different approach and a different kind of eye. Yeah. And then, and then there's, and then I, I Googled this and, and I can't remember his name, but it's in my book. Um, I, and I looked it up in the Lifetime channel and there was a YouTube video and you can see him like a little four year old kid on camera and they, and he gave him a picture. Uh, with, I mean, a, a, like an eight and a half by 11 of about 12 different pictures, headshots of people. And he said, do you reckon, they said, do you recognize anybody here? And he says, yeah, I recognize somebody here. This one right here. I recognize that's me. And he pointed a picture of Pam Robinson. That's amazing. <laughs> that's, there you go. <laughs> and, and I always say, you know, I, I, I always had, trouble accepting the idea of past lives and reincarnation until a friend of mine was telling me about her son who, you know, we've heard this story before. It's a, a young boy who is obsessed with world war two and with world war two fighter planes and all that. Yep. And then, you know, actually starts recounting an entire life that he would have no way of knowing about. And then she's able to go back and verify it. So exactly. when exactly. that happens, you, you can't, you know, but how did, so let's get into how it happened for you then. How was it that you were yep. able to discover that you would have these past lives and be able to get such great detail out of them? Yeah. So the very first one, so I, the one I told you about happened in 1979, the Carthaginian African slave from 2300 years ago. Um, that happened in 1979. That's when that one occurred to me. Um, the very first uh, experience that I had was 1977, and I'll call it an experience because I didn't know it was past life related until later. 
So what happened was, uh, and again, I never thought I'd be talking about past lives uh, back then, so I never journaled this stuff. So if anybody who's listening is getting kind of hits, I call them hits, of memories and little pieces of memories in the jigsaw puzzle, write it down, because I wish I'd written it down. I'd, that's a, but, but I knew it was 1977. And sometime in the beginning of 1977, um, what happened was um, I um, had a dream. And in the dream, to and this goes to one of your other previous callers' questions about trauma experience in this lifetime, I had a very traumatic dream in 1977. Um, and it was so upsetting. To, it was the most upset emotionally I've ever been in, in, that, in my lifetime. You know, I was 26 years old at the time. And so up to that point in this lifetime, I'd never experienced anything so emotionally distressing to me. I was so upset. And I woke up from this dream, and it left this impression, obviously, in me uh, um, when I woke up. So I had that dream. Fast forward uh, to the fall of 1977. That's how I know this happened in 1977, because there's an event that happened in 1977 that I was at. I was at a long meditation course in switzerland i was in wildersville switzerland those people who maybe maybe you have callers from uh, or, or listeners in europe uh, it's a small village outside of interlaken switzerland most people know interlaken switzerland it's a beautiful area and i was there november to december 1977 on a long two-month meditation course so back then so just quick history was very brief I, I used to teach TM, Transcendental Meditation. I studied personally with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who taught the Beatles to meditate. I, uh, he taught them in 1968, February 1968 in India. He taught them. They met him in the uh, winter of 67. I learned in 1970. I studied with him personally in 1971, 73. I was one of the international leaders in his, in his TM organization, Transcendental Meditation organization, for about 10 years. And then I left the organization when they went off in a different direction. So, but in 1977, I was very much still part of his organization, and I was on a long TM meditation course, meaning every day for two months, meditating all day, every day, okay? And we would sit in these, uh, we, you know, hotels, uh, we'd take over the hotel and so forth, so maybe in my hotel there were 75 or 80 of us and so forth, and we would put foam, four-inch pieces of foam with, uh, you know, a twin bed sheet on them, Covered the whole ballroom, in, the, in our case, the dining room floor. Because the, our hotel was small, it didn't have a ballroom. But it had a dining room. Move all the furniture out, replace it with fo- wall-to-wall foam. So we're sitting there doing group meditations on the foam. In the middle of the group meditation, and we're doing these various types of techniques, and one of the techniques was basically what your listeners would understand as an energy technique, where we're kind of kundalini energy, you know, moving that kind of energy through your body, through your energy field, etc., so we're doing those, and a lot of people are just kind of hopping around. And so it's all guys. We separated the guys and the, and the women for kind of obvious reasons. <laughs> so we would stay focused on the meditation and not other things. And, and so <laughs> we're, we're, a lot of the guys were hopping around. What happened with me was I flipped over on my back, and I'm starting to get crucified upside down. I'm reliving a crucifixion. So you talk about traumatic experience to your earlier call being crucified, I'm experiencing the pain, the emotional anguish, etc. All this stuff is going through me. Um, my feet are up in the air. Everybody else is like getting kundalini rushes and they're hopping around sort of in cross-legged fashion on these foam, uh, wall-to-wall foam. I'm just stationary on my back. My feet are up in the air. I'm getting crucified. Okay, so f- then we go off on these walks after lunch. And so I'm walking up in this pastoral, beautiful setting in Switzerland. There's cows grazing on both sides. It's a beautiful afternoon after lunch. So my friend George and I, George Hammond and I, are walking up this path together just after lunch before we go back to the hotel and meditate all afternoon again before dinner. So I'm telling George, you know, George, I I had this dream about six or eight months ago, and I just started to tell him the beginning of the dream, that I was really upset in the dream. And he says, oh, yeah. And he finished my dream. He finished all the details of my dream. You were in a ditch. You were on the side of the road. You were crying. You were really upset. This is what you were wearing, the leather sandals and blah, blah, blah. And you get this dirty brown tunic on and so forth and so on. I said, how did you know? 
He said, because I found you. So I'm getting chills right now saying this. So he said, I found you 2,000 years ago. He said, you know, you've been flipping over in your back for two weeks. Every time we meditate, you know, in the dining room on the foam, you're sitting there and you're, you're flipped over and you're back upside down saying you're getting crucified. And I, he said, you know who you, you are? And I said, no. So I, so hit a little background. I grew up Protestant Christian, but I did not pay attention in Sunday school. I was just goofing around, teasing the girls. That's what I did. But George is Catholic, altar boy, blah, 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 paid attention, knew, no, you know, knows the Bible and all the stories in it and everything. So he said, you were, Peter was crucified upside down. So then I started relaxing and I started having all these memories from that lifetime, Tim. That, that floodgate opened over a bunch of years. And then I had other memories also from, uh, that, that, that cascaded and I opened up more and more and more. We can talk about some of those as well. But you want to follow up? Well, I was just going to say, so that's the, then it turned into a floodgate situation. So then, I mean, yeah. how do you handle something like that? How do you handle that much information coming into you all at once? I just, I just parked it because I never thought I was going to be talking about it. So I just thought, how can I use this to help me now in that, at that point, 1977, Kelvin Chin life? Because I've always been a pragmatist. I've always been a practical person. I thought, well, I'm never going to talk about this, so who cares where I remember I was and whatever. How does it help me? How does it inform me more about who I am today? And how can I use tidbits of these memories to help me today? So that's what I teach. That's what I teach people. Because to me, that's what's informed me and helped me live life more fear-free and more productively in these various ways, whether it's the Carthaginian experience or whether this was this memory being with Jesus 2000 years ago and so forth and and having clear memories of the conversations that we had together and so forth and how it's very different from what we know as Christianity today which is really an off it's really cre- a creation of Paul who 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 took the teachings off in a completely different direction it's very little to do with Jesus although there's some tidbits of it sprinkled of Jesus's teaching sprinkled throughout Christianity most of it's Paul's Paul's teaching, and then many other hundreds of other Christian uh, people who became Christian followers of Paul who added to it over the hundreds of years before the actual um, official Bible was created by, um, you know, the first first Roman Christian emperor, Constantine, in in, uh, about 360 AD is what the religious historians think, is when the first official Bible was. So it was just a, a collection of stories and so forth, and and um, n- not agreed upon by the Christian leaders until the 200 plus, two or 300 plus Christian bishops got together in uh, 360 AD in, in Nicaea, uh, outside Constantinople, um, at the behest of the Roman Emperor Constantine, who was a Christian, to create the official first Christian Bible. But that's very different from what I remember from the teachings of Jesus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we can get into some of that and even more. We're going to take our last break, and then we'll have our final segment of the night with our guest, Kelvin Chin. If you would like to call in with any questions, 508-322-1985 is the number. Email tim at midnight.fm or jump into the Midnight Society Facebook group and post your questions in there as well. We'll be back in just a few moments with more Midnight Society right here on midnight.fm.
And welcome back. Our final segment tonight with our guest, Kelvin Chin. We're talking about experiences on the other side, and we were talking to him before the break about how he came to realize that he had had these uh, past life experiences and the memories all coming to him about those. And and really, Kelvin, what's fascinated me about your experiences is how in-depth that they are. And, and does that... Was that something that was part of that instantaneous flooding or have you had to kind of think back and bring yourself back into some of those lives to, to really get a lot of the details? Yeah, it's an interesting question. It's a good question because here's the thing. So first of all, I wasn't looking for anything. So people should understand this is spontaneously. It just happened to me. It was just like first I had that dream. I didn't even know the dream was related to anything. And then I had the experience being crucified and so forth. And then uh, they're just completely spontaneous. I used to make fun of people who talked about reincarnation back in the 70s. I was like, yeah, yeah, they're making this stuff up. Give me a break. And then I started having experiences. I'm like, whoa, what? And so it would come to me in pieces. And so um, that first one I just told you was fairly, it kind of flooded me fairly powerfully. And a lot of the floodgate, as I say, kind of open. Others were not not so much. Like I've had memories as several Buddhist monks, um, uh, a woman, I have a memory of being a woman, I, being a crusader, being a lot of different things. Here's, here's one that came very in, in a very unusual way. So in 19, around 1979, around the same time I had the Carthaginian slave memory, I had a knowingness. It wasn't a memory. So this is a good teaching example uh, to answer your question, Tim, um, for people. I, I, it didn't even come as a memory. It came as a knowingness that I had been a king of Prussia. I didn't even know what Prussia was. Right. And a king of Prussia, what? I didn't even look it up because, like I said, I never thought I'd be talking about this stuff. So I was like, oh, big deal. Okay, whatever. King of Prussia, I don't even know when that is, what that is. I knew it at some, some place in Europe, Prussia, uh, but I didn't know exactly when. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought, hey, is this around the First World War? I, I didn't know. You know, I didn't think much about it. 1979, just the knowingness. So that's all that was. It wasn't a memory. I had no vision like I did in the other one and so forth. It was just, it was just a knowingness. Knowingness, what I mean by that is like, how do, how do you know, how does your listeners know that they're listening to Tim Weisberg and Kelvin Chin on this, uh, 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 on this radio podcast right now? They just know it. You don't have to go ask a neighbor to come over and say, now, what am I doing right now? You just have a knowingness. You know what you're doing, okay? That's what I had, a knowingness that I'd been a king of Prussia at some point. And, and that was just a random thing. That just was parked in my mind, Tim, for many, many decades until in the 1990s, I had, um, uh, in the late 1990s, I had a knowingness. I always knew that I had been, I had a connection with ancient Rome. Uh, also, I'd been several Egyptian priests back then, too, a long time ago. I'm not exactly sure when. But I just had knowingness of these and some visual stuff. And I knew I'd been in ancient Rome. And in the late 1990s, I, I, I saw the movie Gladiator and I, and I saw Marcus Aurelius and I knew Marcus Aurelius was incredibly familiar to me. I started reading about some of his biography and all of these flood. So, so those, those memories of being him started flooding me in the back of one of those books. Uh, that I was reading about Marcus Aurelius. Okay, this is the fall of the breadcrumbs thing that I tell people, suggest that they do. There's a random chapter, and it talks about other people in history who revered and respected Marcus Aurelius. And in the 18th century, in the 1700s, there's a resurgence in interest 1,700 years later, after Marcus Aurelius died, in Marcus Aurelius. And it talks about a king of Prussia who modeled his life after Marcus Aurelius. So then I follow the breadcrumbs again. I look up who's this king of Prussia, and it's this guy, Frederick II, known as Frederick the Great. And so then I look up Frederick the Great more, and I find out that Frederick the Great, and most historians have completely overlooked this factoid, but Frederick the Great bought an expensive statue of a relatively unknown Roman emperor, Antoninus Pius, Nobody knows who Antoninus Pius. Most people don't never, never heard of him. Nope, you know, but uh, he, he's a relatively unknown Roman emperor. And, and Frederick the Great, Frederick II, in in Prussia, in seventeen fifty or sixty something, seventeen fifties or sixties, 
bought an expensive statue of Antoninus Pius and prominently placed it in his palace garden. Who's Antoninus Pius? It was Marcus Aurelius's stepfather. How crazy is that? Yeah. Right? Then, add to, add to that story, just in February 2020, just what, what's that, whatever that is, four or five months ago, I met this guy, I, 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 I connected with him on Facebook and so forth. He's also a former teacher of Transcendental Meditation, a TM teacher from the 1970s. Somehow we met, and, and he tells me, I tell him about my past lives, and he goes, oh, you know, Charlie Lutz was talking about this guy who was a TM teacher. So who's Charlie Lutz? Charlie Lutz was one of the early TM teachers who first met Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in 1959. When Maharishi first left India and came to the United States, Charlie Lutz was in, was in charge of this arm of the TM organization that I had, that I was not part of, which was called the Spiritual Regeneration Movement, SRM. And it was a very spiritually oriented arm of the organization. I was in the stress management arm of the organization, the business and education arm of the organization. Charlie Lutz was in this other arm of the organization. I never met him, never heard him talk. Never knew anything about him other than he was the head of that part of the organization. This guy, William Baldridge, tells me in February 2020 that he and some other people had been to some lecture in Los Angeles. I'm in Boston back then in the 1970s. In in, in, uh, Los Angeles had attended a lecture by Charlie Lutz in 1973. So that's four years before my first past life memory, Tim. In 1973, Charlie Lutz was saying there was a TM teacher among us in the organization right now who was the Apostle Peter and Frederick the Great. And this guy, William Baldridge, and his friends always thought that was really weird that this same soul would be those two personalities. Yeah. No, absolutely. And... and Four years before I had any past life memories. I just heard about this in February 2020, this story. I mean, it just goes to show, too, that every, you know, it's not like it's a one and done experience for you to learn from either. You know, the, these these past lives are going to keep no. keep working their exactly. way back into your current life. Exactly. And you learn different things from different lifetimes. I've learned many different things from my Buddhist lifetimes, Buddhist monk you know, from my samurai lifetime, from my crusader lifetime, from my lifetime as this, that, and the other thing. And I think it's sort of, you know, we can choose to learn from these different lifetimes. I don't think anything is written in this, in stone. I don't think Earth is a, is a structural schoolyard. I think people, can, we can use it that way, and we can choose to learn lessons, but that's an individual choice. Not everybody is. Some people are just here to have fun. I mean, literally. I, I mean that seriously. You know, they're just having fun. They're eating a soft serve ice cream. They're just what, doing whatever, you know, they're having a drink at the bar. You know, that's, the, that's what they're doing. And people say, well, what's your life purpose? This and that. For a lot of people, that is their life purpose. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean that in a realistic way. We're not all here learning lessons. Right. Those who choose to, which, and I do, are here learning lessons. Not everybody chooses to. And some of those, you got to think, some of those spirits that are, are, are residing on the other side want to come back to this existence, probably, I would assume, so that they can enjoy some of the, you know, the carnal pleasures of Earth, things that, you, you know. Absolutely. Ice cream doesn't taste you, the same you, in the afterlife. You, you said it more explicitly than I do, Tim. <laughs> My code word that I use is come back for the soft serve ice cream because the you don't have, you don't have taste buds I on should, the other side. You can have soft serve ice cream on the other side, but it, you don't taste it. I, so I, people, you know, you hit right. the nail on the head. I think a lot of people come back to procreate. I miss, to have I misspoke. I meant to say carnate, but yeah, carnal, carnal is what no, really works. You misspoke, but I, you know, you read my mind. I mean, <laughs> uh, so, you know, that's, that's, I'd hate to think that, uh, I hate to think that. You know, that's the only reason that they would come back. But if that's but what it some takes people for some people, that's a primary motivator. You look around. OK, you just be be candid. I mean, those you and the, you, Tim, you and the listeners be candid. I mean, seriously, look around. We're talking seven point six billion people on planet Earth right now. OK, seven point six billion. You look around, just go to the store, just walk around, look around. You look at people, you think those people, they're here to learn spiritual lessons. Really? You really think so? 
I don't, I, you know, I, I, I mean this in the, in the most respectful and humble way to people. It has increased my patience, my understanding and my love for people in terms of understanding, really understanding the full power of free will, that that's their choice. And I need to respect that they may not be here to learn lessons like I am. And I, re- I need to respect that. All right. That's what free will means. That's what's going to bring peace on earth. It's not going to be, you got to do it my way. That is not going to bring peace on earth. Right. And so now the question comes up and I'm sure you get asked this all the time that mm. if you are having these recollections and you're, you're, able to explore these past lives, how do you know that they are legitimate past life memories and not just either, you know, your own imagination bringing you down this path yep. or just yep. something that's been influenced by something that you've seen or heard elsewhere? Yep. The short answer is you don't know. The short answer is there's no absolute, you don't, there's no absolute answer to that. You don't know. And so what I tell people, the first thing I say in my afterlife and reincarnation series, which I'm starting another one on August 16th, by the way. People want to go to my website, kelvinchin.org. They can check that when the, when the uh, calendar of that. Uh, but the first thing I say on day one of my series, six-part series, uh, is, is we don't know. Don't look for absolutes. Look for having experiences and then interpret those experiences based on rational thinking. I, I, I'm a big rational thinker, logical, think about things logically. St- don't make these cognitive dissonant judge, jumps that people make. There's a lot of religious apologists out there who have doctorates and MDs, and they say that they're a doctor, and they are a doctor, but they say that they're a scientist, and they're not. They're religious apologists, and a religious apologist is somebody who's trying to promote and, you're, and persuade you to believe what they believe. That's not what I am. I am. Sh- I share experiences with people just because they're my experiences, and then I have interpretations of those. People can take it or leave what I say. I'm not here to uh, to convince people, to persuade people. I am not a religious apologist. I am trying to look at things in a more rational, logical way. That's what a scientist should do. Many of these scientists out there are conflating and confusing things by using, for example, quantum mechanics theory, which is a probability, mathematical probability theory to explain physical reality, and it's not meant for that. You should talk to a quantum mechanics expert uh, about the conflated use of quantum mechanics in spirituality today. Don't talk to an endocrinologist who, who, who has a doctor in front of his name who claims to know about using that quantum mechanics theory to explain physical reality. Talk to a quantum mechanics expert. I am not a quantum mechanics expert, but I know enough about it to know that it's a conflation to use in explaining these these certain concepts, like this oneness idea, which is a misstatement, and I can explain where the where the confusion comes from. But my point is to answer your question: you don't know, you don't know. So analyze things, and how and and so what do I go by? I go by emotional intensity. What's the emo? I, I, these are different data points that I use. Okay, different metrics that I look for. What's my emotional intensity? For example, the crusader memories that I have, or the, you know, the 2000 year old memory I t- told you about lying in the ditch. Very intense emotional experience, okay? I could taste the dust in my mouth. You start to have multi-sensory experiences. So it's multi-sensory, it's intense emotion, it's real life, it's, and, it, and it's putting together pieces like, for example, the crusader lifetime, when I, when I started screaming Saracens in my meditation once, scared my daughter who was sitting next to me. I was meditating with her. She was in high school at the time. You know, this happened like, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. I yelled out Saracens. I didn't even know what Saracens meant. I'd already had a crusader memory since 19, you know, the late 19, about 1978. I started having a crusader memory. Um, but I had a Saracen, Saracens blurted out of my mouth. Where did that come from? I don't know. I had to look it up. What is a subject, a verb, is an, what is it, a noun, what is it? Uh, you know, I, I, I looked it up, and, and Saracens is the word for Muslims pre-1300 AD. I did not, Kelvin Chin did not know that. So these are little metrics, little data points to answer the person's question. Um, you know, is it an absolute proof? No, but I didn't know the word Saracens. I had no idea what it meant. I had to look it up. 
and and we never called followers of Muhammad and, and, and believers in Islam the religion. We didn't. Muslims is a is a new word. It's only seven hundred years old, thirteen hundred to present. Before that, they were called Saracens. My Crusader experience was in the eleven hundreds, so that's what we called them. And my memory was on horseback with a broadsword. Look, I knew I was six foot five, two hundred and thirty pounds. How did I know that? I don't know. I just knew that. And then I looked up who was six foot five, two hundred thirty pounds, and a leader of the Third Crusades. That's how I found out who I was that lifetime. But I remember a broadsword and holding. I could feel the weight of a of a five and a half pound broadsword. That's a very heavy broadsword. Five and a half, six pounds with a maximum weights on the broadswords. Most swords were around two, two and a half pounds, maybe three in the high end, you know. But 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 bro- I was a huge guy, two hundred and thirty pounds, six foot five, reddish blonde hair, long blonde in the Crusades. You know, I was a big guy and, and, you know, and, and I could feel my, the weight of, of the sword going through body parts. I mean, it's kind of gross, but, you know, that kind of level of memory and emotional and physical tactile memory of what a sword feels like going through vertebrae, it's just, it's kind of gross, but, you know, it's very explicit. And so that's, so these are data points. Are they absolute proof to the, to the questioner? No. It's not absolute proof. There's never any absolute proof. These are interpretations. And, and I'm, quite frankly, I am not even married to the whole idea of past lives. If somebody came up with a better explanation that was logical and rational to me, I would buy into that. I would go with that. I am not, but if this is the most rational one that I can explain because I have had so many memories, uh, pieces in these jigsaw puzzles. You know, my crusader one, I probably have a half a million Pieces out of a hundred, let's say a hundred million pieces. I'm just making numbers up just to give people an order of magnitude. But let's, let's say a, a one lifetime is a hundred million pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and you don't have the cover. You don't have the box covers. You don't know what it looks like and you're piecing them together. And I got five pieces to go together here. I got another 20 pieces over there. Oh, I got 15 pieces to go together over here, but none of those pieces go together with each other, right? But so I have a lot in the crusader and in the, in the Jesus being with Jesus. Uh, 2000 years ago, I have a lot. I have probably half a million of pieces out of a hundred million pieces. But if you do the math, the percentage, it's like a fraction, a fraction of a half of 1%. It's an eensy tiny bit of piece, a piece of 1%, of 1%. So I did the math once. I can't remember what it is, but it's a tiny piece. But, but you put all these together and you kind of go, wow, it seems like it's a real past life memory. So to answer the question of the person who asked, that's as close as I could get. You know, right? And, and Does that no, help? And it certainly, and it certainly seems fair. But you know, getting into the idea then of some of these memories that you do have, and and the people that you've encountered over time, mm. how much mm. does it drive you crazy then when people are having modern day discussions about these people, and <laughs> you have memories of actually knowing them? You know, everybody likes to talk about Jesus now, and there's yeah. a big fight going yeah. on about Jesus, but you knew the dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was he was an amazing amazing is amazing being uh incredibly powerful uh but did the miracles happen yeah i remember the miracles happening he could he could manipulate energy so that's not made up fairy tale stuff it sounds like fairy tale stuff to us right because out of all the stuff the stories about him you think well that's made up no that actually was real he could manipulate energy that's how powerful a being he was but be crucified because of a religious and historic, a religious and political fight amongst the Romans and the Jewish priests and, and the Jewish priests amongst each other and etc. and worried about them losing their power. Yes, that's why he got crucified. He didn't get crucified because Jehovah cruci- were crucified. No, they're very, very close, Jehovah and Jesus, like f- as if father and son. Um, he's, f- Jesus is famous for having said, and he did say, you know, loving somebody like 70 times 7, the most most love of a father could ever have for a son, multiplied by 70 times 7. The huge amount of love for, between Jehovah and, and, and Jesus, those two personalities, I call them. And um, But, but you no, know, he was a very loving person, very powerful person. I mean, one thing that I really have tried for 2,000 years over my many lifetimes to try to exemplify and to try to live myself was his ability to love 
people, really love people. And his definition of love was this, accepting the other person for who they are, not who you wish they were. Getting a little emotional. Um, he, he, that was his definition of love, not who you wish they were. That's the part everybody forgets. You know, it's it's easy to love the, the, the stuff you love about somebody, but what about the stuff that you wish that was different? You need to accept that as well. That's true love. That's true acceptance. That's what I've tried to live in my life. Uh, with, you know, and you know, nobody's perfect, and I'm still working at it. But you know, that's that that's the power that he had. And when people were drawn to him, that that's what drew them. It was like intangible but very tangible at the same time. This strong, energetic pull to him because he accepted you. He could see you. He got you. He knew who you were. And so when I denied him those three times, he knew who I was. It was He came to me again in 2014, and I could see him, his energy body. And he, we talked about that. And, 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 and we talked about how... There was no need, he said, for him to forgive me because he knew who I was, etc. And I was crying in this experience six years ago, etc. It was very emotional for me. And 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 um, but but that 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 ability that he had to transparently see through people and see who for who they were, and then and then this whole idea of seeking the kingdom of heaven within. What was that? What do you mean by that? He meant to turn within. He was teaching. He didn't call it meditation. We called it prayer, but he didn't call, he didn't view prayer as asking for things. So that's the way people have conflated and confused prayer as asking for things because Paul and the Christian church and so forth, and not just Christians, but other religions have been asking the gods for favors and for, you know, gifts and whatever for millennia before Jesus. And so it was already in people's wiring, but his form of prayer that he taught us and he was teaching people then was what I would call meditation today, seeking the kingdom of heaven within, connecting with oneself in that ancient Greek sense of virtue that we talked about earlier. So, I mean, obviously I would think that that's got to be probably the greatest being that you've encountered in, in, in all of these lives that you've had. Who, who is probably the worst person that you've had to deal with? (laughs) The worst person. Oh my God. I'll tell you the worst people I had to deal with was the U.S. government when I was a Native American in the 1850s. I can see that. Um, and and uh, I was unsuc- I failed. I still get emotional about this today. I talk about trauma to the other persons, you know, about uh, I, I, I failed the Native American, my Native American people as a Native American leader in, you know, it, it's hard to beat technology when they got Gatling guns and, you know, whatever. You know, uh, um, so, and they starved us. And I, I went, my daughter went to San Francisco State University, and obviously in San Francisco, and she, she said, oh, daddy, you know that there's, this was about five years ago, she said, oh, daddy, you know that there's, there's bison, there's bison in Golden State Park, Golden Gate Park, Golden Gate Park, uh, right, you know, at the foot of the um, Golden Gate Bridge there, there's this huge park. And so she, she said, yeah, I've seen them. I said, oh, let's go find them. So we went there. We stood up on the bench. There's about maybe half a dozen, six or eight bison in this huge, like three or four football fields, huge fenced in area. And uh, I stood up on the bench because I didn't want to look through the, you know, the, the the chain link wire fence. I stood up on a bench and I just started crying because I remember the U.S. government killing tens of million, tens of millions of bison they killed. Tens of millions. We don't even know how many. Uh, tens of millions of bison were killed because they killed our food supply. And then they, of course, they killed us. And then even, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln, it, during his presidency even, you know, there were um, uh, $200. That's a lot of money in the 1860s. $200 for every Indian killed. Ooh. So there, there were bounties out on us then. The, the, the population, they say, went from 30 million Native Americans in the 1600s, 1700s. In 1800, there were 600,000 left. And in 1890, only 90 years later, 250,000 left. That was it. I died in 1876, I think. Oh, man. I, I can imagine, yeah. I can imagine that that's something that also takes a takes a toll on you even now to to, yeah. to see the way oh. that it goes, and it, it's, it's never going to go away. 
especially uh, now with Black Lives Matter and so forth, it stirs up all my Native American sadness and so forth. And, you know, the, you know, I, I have, I, I'm still working on myself quite to be, to be candid emotionally with that past life because it's not that long ago. Um, you know, with that past life, my emotional trauma of f- the sadness of feeling like I could have done more and I couldn't, I, 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 I went to meet with President Grant and they had set up a meeting with me. Um, I was, I, I had united all the Lakota tribes at that point. I was the head of the six Lakota tribes and I went and represented the, the Sioux Nation, the Lakota Nation and, um, and, um, to talk with Grant and I went to Washington DC and et cetera, et cetera. And he blew me off. Never met with me. Wow. Yeah. Oh, we're the meeting just about, was all meeting was all set up, et cetera, et cetera, and he blew me off. We're we're just about out of time, Kelvin. We, we've uh, we've got about two minutes here left. Real quickly, could you just give us a, an idea of what a soul contract is? I don't want to miss that. Soul out. contract is is a is a is an agreement. That's what a contract is. So, um, but those of you who don't who are lawyers understand that contracts can be changed and contracts can be broken. I think a lot of lay people don't understand that. They they hear contract and they think ironclad. No. Soul contracts we make on the other side, and they can be changed and broken by parties who are not party to the contract sometimes. So I may be, let's say you and I are on the other side, and we decide, Tim, two minutes, you and I decide, oh, let's get together this time, Tim, and let's get together in elementary school and grow up together and hang out and be friends, okay? Because we have this connection on this radio show from this previous lifetime, you know, Kelvin Chin and Tim Weisberg, and, you know, we come back as, with different names and different families and so forth. Let's do that. Okay. We have a contract, okay? Problem is, other minds are involved in our lives too. Our fathers, our father's bosses, the boss's boss's boss. Maybe your bo- your your family that you get incarnated into, Tim, we're in the same town, and all of a sudden you get relocated to Kansas, and then I'm in Boston or wherever, and we don't see each other, right? Until we're thirty years old, maybe we or twenty years old. Maybe we get together when we're in college because our souls, our consciousness is strong enough. Which is, this is a, this is a, this is a plug for strengthening our consciousness now in the present because we take our consciousness, our mind with us into the afterlife. The stronger our mind is in there and then into the next life, our, we're taking that same mind or you know, we want to strengthen it stronger. We increase the probability we can get together in that lifetime because it got blown in our childhood because our boss's boss's boss of our parents relocated our parents. Right. Or one of them. Well, so we can have these contracts, but the stronger our mind is, the more likely we can complete the contract, even if it gets derailed along the way because of the free will minds. No soul contract is absolute. Well, I'm glad that we were able to come back together through whatever contract we have and, and have another great discussion here. And we'll have to do it again sometime. Exactly. Yeah, love it, Tim. All right, Kelvin. Fun. Take care and be safe out there with uh, with whatever future lives hold for you. And we'll talk with you again sometime soon. If anybody else wants to learn about their own past lives or learn about overcoming the fear of death, all you have to do is reach out to Kelvin at kelvinchin.org or turningwithin.org, linked up at midnight.fm. That'll do it for tonight and for this week. We are out of time. Stay tuned for Sunday's announcement about next week's lineup. Tune in to Hotel Paranormal tomorrow night on the Travel Channel. And until then, have a good night and enjoy every sandwich.